<laughs> Welcome, everyone, uh, to the Thursday, November 14th, 2019, regular board OPP, OPPD board meeting. Uh, Mr. Tim Burke, and President, will give us our safety briefing. Okay, welcome, everyone. You're in the uh, auditorium um, at the Energy Plaza um, on the uh, east side of the building. Um, there are two uh, doors, uh, exit doors uh, behind you, in front of me, and two to the side of me, one on the right and one on the left. Uh, the board will exit on the doors on the right or left. We would ask you to take the exits in the rear, um, and you will be directed by one of our emergency resource staff uh, to appropriate uh, safe uh, place. Um, if we need to exit the building, we would ask you to go through our atrium and exit on the Harney Street side uh, to exit the building. We would ask you not to go down the steps. It's just an additional hazard. But in the event you have to use steps, we would ask you to use your three-point touch, one hand on the railing and two feet on the ground. Uh, the fire extinguishers are just outside uh, this door to my left uh, and around the corner uh, against the wall. There's also a fire extinguisher in the kitchenette um, as well. If you have a medical condition, please write it down or tell your neighbor. The AD and the first aid kit are on the brick wall to the right of the cafeteria en entrance. So if you go through the, the double doors, so to speak, or the double windows, um, it is on the brick wall, one on top of each other. And is anybody here certified in the use of an AED or in CPR? All right, very good. Those that you who aren't, I would ask you to go to the OPPD wire story and um, hear the story about our uh, director of safety and technical training, Kevin McCormick, and I'm hopeful that will change your mind to get certified in the use of an AD or in CPR. In case of emergency, uh, Mo or a member of our security team will call 911. Um, in case of a fire, we would ask you not to use the elevators and, and we would exit again on the Harney Street side or to the nearest exit and we'll be directed by our emergency response team as well. Uh, we don't anticipate a tornado or severe weather, but in the event, uh, you will be directed to a uh, uh, to an appropriate location and a secured location within this building. The board and the executives would go to the call center area, which is a secured area uh, as well. And with that, that concludes my safety briefing. Okay. Thank you. I'm looking for my chair opening statement. Well, where is it? Ah, here it is. It was right there. Notice of the time and place of this meeting was publicized by notifying the area news media by public. There you go. You've got a different one. Thank you. You have too many papers today. I don't know why. Uh, okay, we're going to run through our list of guidelines for the conduct of the meeting. Uh, first and foremost, please silence your electronic devices. Uh, this regular board meeting will follow the agenda made available to the public upon entering the meeting. The meeting is streaming live on the internet OP at oppd.com. Our regular board meetings have public comment periods on the agenda. Following board discussion on each pending matter, I will ask for public comment and before bringing the matter to a vote. Also prior to adjournment of the meeting, you'll have the opportunity to comment on any other OPPD matters. If you wish to speak, please approach the microphone to your far left and state your name and address and state the name of any organization or person you are representing. Organizations should choose one representative to speak on their behalf so as to avoid repetitive commentary. Comments made by all parties during the meeting are a part of official public record. Each individual will be allotted three minutes per uh, matter pending at the discretion of the board. To assist you, we use a red, yellow, green light indicator to ensure each member of the public receives a consistent amount of time. Ms. Henners will signal you when you re uh, 30 seconds remain as well as when time is up. Please direct your comments to me, not to other board members or the executive team. I will either respond to you directly or defer to another board member or the officer of the district. If you brought any written materials, Ms. Henners will receive them on your behalf. Now, Ms. Henners, you can take roll. Bogner? Here. Kavanaugh? Here. Gay? Here. McGuire? Here. Mohawk? Here. Moody? Yep. Williams? Here. Yoder? Here. Announcement regarding public notice of meeting. Notice of the time and place of this meeting was publicized by notifying the area news media by publicizing same in Outlets newsletter and on OPPD.com by displaying such notice on the arcade level of Energy Plaza since November 8, 2019, and by emailing such notice to each of the district's directors on that same date. A copy of the proposed agenda for this meeting has been maintained on a current basis and is readily available for public inspection in the office of the district's corporate secretary. Additionally, a copy of the Open Meetings Act is available for inspection in the public meeting book located in this meeting room. 
Board consent action items. The consent agenda action items are as follows. Item number five, approval of the September 2019 Comprehensive Financial and Operating <coughs> Report, October 2019 meeting minutes, and the November 14, 2019 agenda. Agenda item six, SD 13, Stakeholder Outreach and Engagement Monitoring Report, resolution number 6345. Item number seven, Metro and Rural Underground Cable Replacement Contract, Resolution number 6346. Item number eight, SD7, Environmental Stewardship Policy Revisions, Resolution number 6347. Item number, um, number nine, SD8, Employee Relations Policy Revisions, Resolution number 6348. And item 10, Board Meeting Schedule, Resolution number 6349. If there are no corrections, changes, or additions to the consent agenda items, I need a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda items. So moved. Second. We have a second. Do we have any discussion on these board consent items? I think someone noted they would like some. Mr. Williams. Yeah. Um, first on uh, SD 13 about uh, outreach and engagements. Um, I mentioned some comments on Tuesday about um, uh, both the outreach that had happened over the course of the year and how important the power with purpose engagement was to the uh, monitoring report because um, there were a lot of activities that were accounted and staff has done a great job um, in many areas. Uh, however, in what was what is probably the largest area of engagement opportunity over the last year, um, the power with purpose, uh, I feel that, that um, more would have been appropriate. And so uh, the timeline for <coughs> Uh, the opportunities for customers to be engaged with this very important decision that we will be uh, asked to vote on here in a little while, I feel was uh, not long enough relative to the um, scale and scope of the decision that we're making today. And I think that that was reflected by some of the comments from the public. And so as we look back at the last year's engagement, yes, there were great, um, great community support activities. Uh, there was great engagement on the community solar. We received great response to a number of different items. But specifically with the largest item that, uh, that occurred in the last year, I felt that um, more would have been appropriate. And um, I also mentioned that the gradations of review of monitoring report only come in a couple different forms. Um, the recommendation today is that we are uh, sufficiently compliant with the directive as written. Um, below that, there would be another term, which I think we talked about a little bit, um, moving in the direction of. Um, and then there would be a third option for strategic directives, but uh, has not ever come up and so isn't really very well identified what that specific language would be. Um, that leaves me in a little bit of a, an unusual or an, an awkward position because I feel that it's difficult to express appreciation for specific things that have gone extremely well while simultaneously saying there are areas where I feel different and more work would have been appropriate and necessary. And so this is on the consent agenda today. Um, I just wanted to reiterate that over the course of the year, there were lots of successful things that were done in the customer engagement area, but that with regards to power with purpose, I feel the timeline, the amount of outreach and other areas were um, less than would have been ideal. Uh, part of the response on Tuesday was that this leverage is into the decarbonization and that additional engagement will be done through that decarbonization study, which is um, admirable and I look forward to talking about that um, over the coming months. Uh, however, future activity is not a relevant consideration on an annual monitoring report based on the activities that have already been completed in the past year. And so um, in several areas we have heard this will be covered in the decarbonization study. That's excellent and I look forward to seeing that activity but that doesn't reflect backward onto the activities that have already been completed this year. So I guess in general, um, this is a consent agenda item um, and it will be voted with the rest of them, but I just wanted to highlight again that the ability to indicate separately success or needs improvements on different portions of any monitoring report um, is extremely, uh, is, is limited and puts me in a, a challenging position today. So I just wanted to highlight again that I feel in the largest area of customer engagement over the last year, more would have been appropriate, and I wish that we had uh, we had seen more. And I look forward to be to more being accomplished in the future. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your comments. I appreciate your comments. Uh, I think there, in some of that area, there is some lessons learned. I also I think we've discussed that this would go back to the Public Information Committee 
to discuss further that and the stakeholder process and whether or not they wanted to, um, to put more gradations in that. If there are any other comments about do, do, that? Do you mind if I make sure. a comment? Sure. Yeah, and, and Director um, Williams and I uh, had a conversation about this as well, and I'll take full uh, responsibility and accountability for this. Um, uh, our teams are working on some very technical modeling and related work that we needed to do. Um, and unfortunately, we were between a couple hard spots. One, the need to get the information to the board um, and, and we did that in October. Um, we had conversations uh, about the, potentially the impact of this um, earlier, but uh, I, as, as I committed to uh, uh, Director Williams, you know, we will certainly take this into consideration as we begin to um, look at the decarbonization pathway initiative, uh, but we were really tied between very two hard lines. One, to get the information to the board and the ability for us to file it appropriately and have the information appropriate uh, to file it. So um, I, I, I've heard it very clearly and I'll take full accountability and responsibility. And Tim, one more thing in our conversation, can you highlight um, some of what the public should expect during the decarbonization process as far as the engagement? Well, and I think we're building that initiative uh, scope and and timeline now. I think the, the board, when, when that scoping document uh, is complete, the way we've looked at decarbonization, I've said this before, is really bo broken up today as we're looking at it into four distinct parts. There's certainly a generation portfolio decarbonization uh, initiative component. Uh, we believe there's also an internal operations for us to begin to think uh, about decarbonization. We believe there's a community element around decarbonization, and we also believe there's a customer element around decarbonization. And so as we work our way through each one of those kind of categories of decarbonization, uh, we will go ahead and reach out to the public in a variety of different means uh, over the course of the, of the next 18 months or 24 months. Great. Thank you. Any other comments? I, I have one, in. Mm -hmm. um, I appreciate Director Williams bringing this up because there's always room for improvement in anything. Um, the one thing as I say, what we're doing here is saying, is it found su sufficiently in compliance with what we've asked them to do right. so far in a whole year? And I know this came up towards the end of the year, and like, like I said, anything can be improved. However, when we look back, and I'd, I'd encourage anybody to go look at our Tuesday meeting and go through that report, we, we've done a, a tremendous amount of great work, and, and stakeholder engagement means a lot of different things, of course, and I know you were very supportive of that, too. But um, that's anything from, you know, some of a lights out to a pulls down to, to much more complex things like you're talking about. So we can always improve it, yeah, but I, I'm going to vote for this, and I hope others will too, of course, and I know you will too. But, um, but like I say, I don't want to dismiss, and I know you're not, uh, all the great things that have happened over the year because I've had some tremendous um, input from stakeholders actually saying a great job and thank you so much. So. I just want to throw that out there, too, as, as there's always need to improve, but I think we are sufficiently in compliance. Okay. So. Thank you, Mr. Gay. Now, I'd be remiss to mention there is SD7 there. Someone should be talking about SD7 because, this, to me, this is a big deal. <laughs> Director Yoder. Sure. I think it's a big deal as well, and um, big deal because, not, not, uh, not the least of which, we got a ton of comments on it. Uh, this is a, a good change for, um, for a strategic directive. I think we got the most comments on uh, the second bullet that says conduct all of its operations, therefore OPPD shall conduct all of its operations, including operations such as building services and transportation in a manner that strives for the goal of net zero carbon production by 2050. So that's, that's, yeah, there we go. It's well deserved. It's not just the board by any means. Uh, management and, and staff um, helped in a great deal in making this happen. So I, it's, it shows what the team can do together, um, and I really am happy to see it. Um, let me emphasize not only the 2050 and the, and the net zero carbon production, but also the fact that this is inclusive of operations, not just generation. So this is the carbon footprint. Um, and we're very happy to have it happen, and, and uh, I, I think I, well, I'll let other people speak for themselves. 
if they would like. Yeah, I'll just be really quick. Um, I want to echo the gratitude to the public for all of the comments. It, it was really <laughs> enjoyable to read all the stuff that came in. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, thanks to Rick and the Systems Committee for charging this up. Um, you were very efficient in your work. Last year when we updated this, it took well, us a year and a half. I think it was oh. the beginning. Well, so thank you. It maybe a year. There, there, yeah, there was some ground with lead. <laughs> Uh, but thank you, nevertheless, for championing it. And thank you to the senior management team because you were super responsive in, in thinking about how to make some adjustments to it. Um, I'm going to echo something and steal something that Director Malhoff said on Tuesday, which um, that endpoint is critical, right? That net zero by 2050 is important, but the pathway for getting there to me is just even, even more important. If we're going to balloon it out and wait till the end and then get there, it's about, uh, it's about the area underneath that line. So. Um, it's my hope as a director, it's my expectation that we're through the pathways to decarbonization study gonna really map out what that line looks like. And that's to me really what's important is every ton of, of CO2 that you put into the air between now and 2050 is important. And so looking to, to expedite that um, is, is great. So it's a great step. So I just have one comment. Passing this resolution is the easy part. <laughs> Getting there is the most difficult part, and the, resol the resolution that we'll be voting on later in this um, in this session will um, kind of lay the groundwork for that. But this is the easy part. Getting there is the hard part, and all of you who commented and said you wanted it, you're going to have to help us get there um, yeah, because it's, it's going to take a lot of community engagement. It's going to be a challenge for our employees. It's going to be a challenge for senior management. And it'll be a challenge for the community as we start talking about demand management and energy efficiency. And how do we get from not only um, decreasing our carbon generation footprint, but how do we as a community and everyone who has a gas here in their home um, generating emissions just as we are, how do we move that needle as well? So cars. I think this is the easy part. Um, we'll need all of you to get us to the end point and to all the steps along the way. So, so what I'll add here, thank you. That was nicely said, Director Molhoff. I think, you know, what the challenge really is, is that the way that we've thought about what we've done in the past to get us to this point is not the same type of thinking that we'll need over the next 30 years to get to that goal. What I'm really hopeful for is that as we um, get through the decarbonization pathways study, that we might be able to come back to um, the board here and revise that 2050 number to something faster. I know there were a lot of public comments about get there faster. And I know the reason why we want to do 2050 now is very much tied to some of the commitments that we've made to other people that we serve. Um, but I'm hopeful that, that 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 will be a future resolution that the board can consider. Thank you. I, I want to mention, uh, since I'm Director Kavanaugh and I are the ones that have been, been around, um, I want to mention sort of like the history of this. You know, OPPD has been interested in the environment and in the climate for a long time. It goes back, and I was just laughing with Mr. Burke. He says, oh, you really want to bring that up? Am I that old? I said, yeah, you are. 1996, an inconvenient truth, when that came out, Gary Gates said, OK, all of management, senior management, is going to go watch this. They went to the basement of Burke's house and watched Inconvenient Truth and started talking about this and saying, what are we going to do about this? And then we go into 2000, and we had, we had problems as far as the state legislature and everything because we have to have the lowest, you know, the lowest cost service. So how are we going to do that? We can't provide that. So we had to go to the state legislature and work with the, with the legislature as far as changing rules that we could have PPAs uh, and investor-owned companies come and build these wind farms. And I have the first wind farm hat, by the way, flat water, okay? I still wear it all the time because it's my favorite hat, the flat water hat. 2004, 60 megawatts. It's also the most expensive wind farm we have, as Mr. Her Her Javier <laughs> can uh, point out, too. That is the most expensive thing. And we've continued that. In 2010, 
we went ahead and we said, okay, we're going to set a really a goal of 10% renewable by 2020. Okay, we blew that out of the water by 2006. We set a goal again. Our goal again is to blow it out of the water just like we had. But what we need is a lot more research, a lot more new stuff coming in that, you know, and we're going to be ready and we're going to be looking for it. When it's there, we're going to use it. But we're going to use it that we're not going to go break. We're, we're not going to be the first ones to do it. We can't be early. I always say we cannot be the very, we were sort of early here, but we can't do that on big, big, big stuff. We're going to go bankrupt, you know. But I mean, we're going to go do this. And the decarbonization study will get us there. And I'm very, very happy. To me, it's a great day. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Um, I just, I just say we had a short eight-hour meeting on Tuesday <laughs> to, to dis discuss these things. And if anybody's interested, I think really this is on a consent. I get it, but if you're really interested in what our paths are and the conversations going on, <clears throat> tune into those meetings are online. So I'd throw that out there. Um, Director Yoder and I talked a little bit after the meeting on Tuesday. Um, we've highlighted several times throughout the year that the board, through strategic directives, is setting what we're looking for, and then management and staff are carrying out how we're going to get there. But um, saying net zero by 2050 is uh, a specific goal, and I am extremely proud that we will be a net zero goal uh, utility. That is an excellent accomplishment. However, that leaves a lot of latitude as to how that's going to be carried out. And so Director Yoder and I talked about the idea of legislative intent, or how do we discuss with staff by the time we get to the first monitoring report under this new strategic directive, what is it we hope to see? And a couple of those things were covered on Tuesday, um, specifically the idea that we would have um, a breakdown of carbon emissions by source included in that, uh, in that report, um, and that the first report should be considered a baseline uh, from where we have been as we look forward toward that net zero goal. Um, that we would have a projection of future annual emissions so that we could understand how we think we're going to be on that path toward 2050, that it's not linear all the way out to 2049 and a drop to zero. That's not what we should expect, but having a better idea of how we're going to get there would be very helpful in that baseline report. And then annually, we should expect an update of how we've done in the past year and previous years relative to the projection of where we're looking in the future. And so I think that um, looking forward to that first SD7 modern report under the new guideline, um, we've talked with um, Mary Fisher about, uh, about setting that baseline and then how we're going to carry that forward. I think those are excellent, um, excellent uh, ideas that we can hope to see a year from now when we see that monitoring report. Um, Reading through the comments, uh, yes, uh, almost everybody was overwhelmingly supportive of this, uh, asking us, yes, this is great, please do more. Uh, some people um, wanted the timeline to be sooner, as was mentioned. Um, very few said they didn't feel this was necessary or that they would rather have us do something else. A, a couple were in there, um, but a lot of that came from, uh, was backed by anecdotal or incorrect information. And so I look forward to being able to provide, as we move forward, uh, updated information about why this is necessary and how we're going to be accomplishing that and how the decarbonization study is really going to flesh out a lot of the details that we're outlining in the strategic directive. So again, I'm very happy to see us become a net zero goal utility. I think this is excellent work by, um, by the committee, the whole board, and especially by staff to help us set this and say, this is where we want to go. Let's start moving that direction. OK. There are no further comments. Are there any comments from the public? David Corbin, 1002 North 49th Street, uh, Chair of the Nebraska Sierra Club. I commend you on uh, moving from your first goal when I started coming to the meetings of 10% of renewables by 2020 to what you've just described. Uh, in 2050, I'll be 104. So what I hope that will happen between now and when I'm 104 is that when I'm 84, when I'm 94, I will see direct progress towards this goal and that it's not put off. Uh, I will be addressing comments that I think uh, are contrary to uh, that goal when we talk about uh, your power with purpose later. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Amanda Calloway. I'm with Nebraska Conservation Voters. In case you don't know, NCV protects our state's natural legacy by educating voters, advocating for sound policies, and electing conservation champions. Since last month's board meeting, we have conducted a poll of Omaha voters. The poll concluded that a majority of Omaha voters believe that Nebraska should get 100% of its electricity from clean renewable sources by 2050. The poll also revealed that 65% of voters believe we should prioritize clean energy sources like wind and solar when choosing new energy generation, whereas only 17% of voters concluded we should prioritize fossil fuels. These results demonstrate that there is significant support for clean energy and shows that our constituents support your proposed goal of net zero carbon by 2050. We're happy to see that you've voted in favor of net zero carbon and becoming a clean energy leader in Nebraska. Thank you. John Pollock, 1412 North 35th Street, Omaha. Um, this is uh, relevant to the decarbonization goal, and I agree fully with the idea of having uh, not just ballooning it out to 2050, but uh, doing the best we can as early as we can. Uh, I've got a meteorological reason to underscore this. Uh, every five years, there's a uh, an update to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And up to this point, they've been very consistent in saying that uh, if you double the carbon dioxide, uh, you get approximately three degrees Celsius worth of global temperature rise. The next set of models, which are going to be incorporated into the next report, there's been uh, quite a ripple in the research community because a lot of them are coming in around five instead of three. Uh, the reasons for it are uncertain, so it could be that the models have some kind of systemic error, although there are a lot of different ones. Uh, it could be something about the atmosphere that wasn't understood, and once the physics is incorporated into the models, there is an indirect effect. But at any rate, that simply underscores that uh, if it turns out to be right, we're headed for two and a half, where we thought we were headed for one and a half degrees warming, and it basically underlines the urgency of what we're doing. Thank you. Written testimony, should I bring it to you? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Ken Winston, and I'm representing Nebraska Interfaith Power and Light. Um, and our uh, members and supporters that live in the Omaha Public Power District um, service area. Well, first of all, I wanted to just say that I agree with Director Yoder. This is a big deal. Uh, I'm a little surprised it's on the consent agenda, but, but I'm glad that si signifies something as well, that um, the fact that, that, uh, that this means that there's been a lot of progress, as Director McGuire indicated, that there's been a lot of work that's been done by a lot of people along the way to make this happen. And so mm -hmm. I really want to salute that and, and to salute you for all the efforts that all of you have made to make this happen. Um, and um, in particular, considering the fact that other utilities in the state aren't even willing to talk about the idea of uh, decarbonization, I think, I think that's also significant, the fact that, that you're willing to set a goal and, and uh, to set it out there. Now, um, I guess one of the things that I wanted, um, now the letter that I provided addresses both this and, uh, and the, um, the later uh, discussion on uh, the, the solar purchase, the, the power of purpose. So you can read both at the same time. But I guess one of the things that I, I also want to say is that we also need to be thinking, um, as was indicated, that, that, um, that, this is, uh, that we can't just look at this as 2050. It, it needs to be all the steps along the way, and several people made comments about that, that all those need to be considered. And, and in addition, uh, we would suggest that re-examining re this policy within uh, a reasonable time, within three to five years, and say, how are we doing, and can, can we shorten the deadline? Because the problem is, even as, as significant as this is, climate change uh, doesn't give out any medals. Uh, it's, it's not going to say, good job. What's going to happen? We need to, to take steps as 
much as we can as quickly as we can. And greatly appreciate all of the steps that are being taken here. Um, if I have time, uh, I will also discuss uh, the, uh, the other, uh, the power of purpose uh, later in, in the meeting. Mm -hmm. So thank you. I have that opportunity. Thank you. <clears throat> Luis Jimenez, 2205 North 24th Street. Um, good day, board members. This is a difficult discussion because we're dealing, talking about technologies and numbers that represent uh, various things. Um, so I, I've been trying to get a, a handle of the information. Um, I do know that uh, 2050 is, is an easy uh, date of attainment. Uh, I think that uh, you, you guys are already operating at 50 percent <throat> or close to 50 percent uh, in renewable or, or not like a dirty uh, energy. And Omaha is a dirty city. It, it, you have vehicles every day just emitting carbon. Um, your entity has been emitting carbon for some time. So the net zero goal should also be with re, uh, taking back, uh, reclaiming the carbon that uh, your, your organization has uh, been uh, um, emitting into the uh, atmosphere. Uh, so, I, and, I, and I'm not saying that you guys aren't doing a good job. It's just that, that this is, this is uh, something that uh, we need to be acting in every way possible along the margins, uh, radically, however you can, to reduce uh, the um, carbon footprint. Because unfortunately now, climate change has been, been put to be a topic for the youth, and that the youth should be the ones concerned. Um, and that's unfortunate because the people responsible for it is is the older generation. Um, you know, I, I'm at fault too as well because I drove vehicles for a long time. I haven't had a vehicle for I think uh, four years now. Um, so I'm trying to do my best not to put my uh, carbon footprint. Um, but I, I I really do think that um, 2050 is is not where we're going to end up. I think we're going to end up attaining it much sooner than that. And, th and this is a general discussion. I understand since you're the board, you're, you're kind of up here and you're still trying to figure out what's, what's going to be set down to um, the, the foots on the ground, I, I suppose. Uh, but I, if we can get more information, more details as soon as possible, I think that it, it would help the community to understand the wh where we're heading. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Talon LaRue, 624 North 41st Street. I don't really know where to begin, but I think that the goal of 2050 is nice, but we're already at a threshold that can't be sustained and have never, never been sustainable, uh, particularly Right now, we have the Keystone XL pipeline training to come through, which is extremely dangerous. Perhaps this isn't you know, on the consent of agenda items, but uh, we have all the Ogallala Aquifer underneath us. We have the watershed of the, the river, which is, makes up the majority of the middle of the, the United States. Um, and we're going to be trying to push a pipeline through that has leaked three times already, five times now. The recent ones, 407,000 gallons, and just a couple of days ago, 383,000 gallons. Solar and wind are viable, but uh, they're, you know, we need something to turn to, so they need to be there. But first and foremost, those things need to be stopped. The average person driving their car every day isn't really a big deal compared to massive companies creating the majority of the world's pollution. And there is no excuse whatsoever. People like to talk about getting jobs out of the deal. There's maybe 35 permanent jobs. Uh, multiple treaties with natives who are most effective are broken. They are legally binding. Um, not to mention man camps. The oil is going to be exported. It's not going to be here for us. Gas prices will go up. They won't 
level out or go down. Uh, 181 million metric tons of CO2 each year. If we put up windmills and solar, that's nice, but it doesn't stop that sort of stuff. We do I think you're um, to discussing like about power with purpose. Is that what you're talking about? Maybe that. I mean, the technologies exist. We have them, no, no, but no. we don't put the money well, there. I'm, I'm saying that right now we're talking about net zero carbon by 2050. We're not the power with purpose uh, action item hasn't been brought up yet, and I think that's what I, you're talking I about. I have to go to work. I'm going to say oh, what I want to okay. say. Okay, that's and fine. Just be done with it. And yes, well, I don't know. There's so much to talk about. I don't think that I have the time or the ear from you all. But it is on our shoulders, the younger generation. We aren't responsible for it, but we're taking responsibility, and we would like to be heard. Um, 30 seconds, sir. I admire the goal that you're setting and the steps you've taken and would like to see more. And uh, have a good day. Thank you. And we will take uh, your comments since you have to leave early as far as the power with purpose, as far as the gas. Hi. <clears throat> Laverne Drain, 49th in Chicago. Um, I like to comment on SD7. Um, I know you guys worked the language to death, but um, on the second, the second to bottom bullet, I think if you change it one word, conservation to efficiency, you would achieve the goals you guys all express. Conservation literally means to do without and creates no value. Efficiency is to do more with less, which creates value. That's the value creator, efficiency. <clears throat> so I'd like, of course, my dream sentence would be efficiency, storage, and generation to minimize our environmental impact. But I know you won't go with the storage and generation. So just change the one word and then you start to create value. Conservation, I don't want to do without, you don't want to do without, nobody in this room wants to do without, nobody wants to be cold, Jimmy Carter put his sweater on, lost. It just doesn't work. Efficiency is what we really need there. And then the last bullet I'd really like for you to say, it says advocate, ed advocate educate local, state, federal governments to protect and advance OPBD's environmental uh, interests. And it stops. What I'd like you to do is change the word interest to stewardship so then it says, advance OPPD's environmental stewardship through the support of technological solutions. Now you're actively involved. Now you're actually thinking about it and you're getting your tech guys involved and, and you're like, what is the environmental solution to sequester carbon? What is the environmental solution to do all these things? And what's the technological solution? And I know you guys are pursuing that with the new management. You, you hired a, a woman here to really bring technology in and stuff. So if you put that in your, your SD7, then uh, it would be part of uh, what you're supposed to be doing instead of, uh, and I think those two changes would solve all your problems that you guys all expressed uh, here in the last Wouldn't hour. Would be nice? Director McGuire, <laughs> could, could I just, yes, uh, uh, behalf, a behalf point of in government. information that I'd actually like to hand off to Director Williams since he's the one that made the, <laughs> uh, the, the correction there in committee? Uh, Mr. Train, we did update that second to last bullet point to say both conservation and efficiency. Um, those those two words were added um, during Tuesday at the committee meeting through some of the comments we received back. And so that was not felt sufficient to need additional public comment response back. So between Tuesday and today, that second to last bullet point was updated to say both conservation and efficiency. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your comment. We appreciate that. <laughs> I have the old that's, <laughs> that's, okay. that's really good public service. Nice job. <laughs> <laughs> it's efficient. <laughs> It's sufficiently com sufficiently compliant. <laughs> My name is Scott Williams. Um, I live on 93rd Avenue, proudly represented by Director Moody. Um, on the consent agenda, we have a whole bunch of items, but I wanted to try and comment on a couple of them. First and foremost, uh, I commend and applaud and respect and appreciate every one of you sitting at the front table and everyone sitting in the front two, three, four, everybody in this room, everybody involved across the board, all 800,000 of us, setting an SD um, uh, net zero carbon goal is absolutely fantastic. This is a, this is a milestone marker of where we're going to go. And it, uh, it is a, a guidepost, a sign, um, you know, a, a, a green light in the distance for what we can hope for, what we can try to achieve, and where we are going to be going um, as this is approved momentarily. So thank you for all the work that has gone into this. And uh, thank you in advance for all the work that is yet to come in order to try and achieve it. 
Um, with regard to the uh, SD13 monitoring report, um, I think that there are plenty of opportunities for increased public engagement. And I wasn't certain whether um, I would speak now on this monitoring report with regard to that directive or um, in a few moments when we discuss power with purpose. But I do think that is an example of an opportunity for increased opportunity for engagement uh, and uh, dialogue with the community. Um, and so I think there are, there are opportunities for improvement there. Um, I, want to, I, I just want to say thank you for what you've done so far. And I look forward to um, what's going to come in the future. Okay. Thank Thanks. you. If there are no more comments, may we please have a vote on the consent items? Bogner? Yes. Kavanaugh? Yes. Gay? Yes. McGuire? Yes. Molhoff? Yes. Moody? Yes. Williams? Yes. Yoder? Yes. OK, the motion passes. Agenda item 11. Authorization to increase 2019 budget expense limit resolution number 6350. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Directors of the Omaha Public Power District hereby approves a 2019 revised corporate operating plan expenditure amount of $1,227.9 million. Make a motion. Do we have a motion? Yep, I'd make a motion to approve. Second. Okay. Yep. Okay, this sounds. Uh, more than what it is. We discussed this again on in the finance committee and again on, on Tuesday. Uh, is what this is when we allocate so much money that can be spent in our budget last year at this time, we take a good educated guess of here's where we think it'll be. Due to the influx and uh, basically the, uh, what am, the word I'm looking for, it's just our contracts are so volatile now with the different SPP going on that we need to transfer some money. But so I'm going to phone a friend, though. Right? I think Paul we Javier definitely up. should phone a friend yeah. on this one. But anyway, <laughs> what we're going to do is is move some money within the budget. It's all legal and it's not increasing our budget in any way. But Javier Fernandez can kind of walk us through publicly what we're doing as well. So. Certainly. Thank you for the opportunity. As Director Gay mentioned, this is a, um, it's a, it's a big number, $1,227.9 million. However, it is, it is an, an increase of $50 million above the amount that we were authorized by the board to expense uh, last year into 2019. I am very comfortable and I'm very proud and to, to come to you with this resolution, and I'll explain. Um, our operating and maintenance expenses, our capital expenses, all those expenses that we have control over, we've been doing fantastically well. We have been uh, shrinking our budgets, really coming in and uh, implementing cost and process improvement initiatives, lean uh, uh, projects to, to, as one of the uh, members of the public talked about, create, uh, do more with less, create efficiencies, add value. And we've been doing that all across the organization. And that's one of the reasons why we've been able to maintain our no general rate increase uh, commitment three years now going into the fourth year starting next year. The reason these, uh, these resolution is coming to you today is mainly because we have been purchasing power in the market. And those purchases, the dollar amount that we've been uh, using uh, to uh, purchase that power has been significantly larger than what we were expecting uh, a year ago. Many reasons uh, are behind that, but I would say that the most salient reason of that is, is the, the advent of renewables that have caused many great things for the environment, but also they have distorted a lot of market rules that we've had in the past. We've had prices that have been incredibly more volatile than they have been in the past, with prices that are really high and really low within minutes of each other. And we have found ourselves in positions where we are uh, purchasing uh, large volumes of megawatts at significantly higher prices than we had budgeted for. Now, the flip side, we've, we've also been on the selling side. We have been selling power at significantly higher or lower prices than we have sold, that, that we have budgeted for. So it's not all bad news. However, from a legal perspective, we have a, a, um, the legal commitment that we, we can only <coughs> expense, we can only pay and disperse funds up to the limit that the board set last year. And that, 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 that amount is not sufficient. Uh, we, 
all for good reasons. Again, uh, I'm guessing President Burke later on, he's going to talk about the, the huge increases we've made on wind generation. That's a big part of why, why we have to spend a little bit more money uh, purchasing some of this power. So the, these increases, a $50 million increase, we believe, um, our estimates is that the, um, the additional uh, amount that we may need to spend is around 35 to $40 million. We still have a month and a half left to go. Lots of volatility in the market. Uh, I would have to come back for another resolution. So this is a, uh, this is a $50 million increase on, on, on our authority to spend. Now, very, very important is the fact that we are not changing our budgets. Our budgets are what our budgets are, what you approved uh, to us last year. So the budgets remain the same. This is not giving anyone in the company a pass. We will still show, uh, from a budget perspective, that we, we uh, spend more than the budgeted amount uh, on purchase power, and we want to make sure that we, we keep that uh, budget um, isolated. But what this allows us to do is uh, legally uh, be able to spend uh, that additional money that we need to, uh, to finish the year on, on the market. I hope that, that was uh, helpful. Yeah, and I, I think thanks for that uh, explanation. We, I mean, you talk about this for an hour like we did, but, but the, the important thing is we wanted to bring it to a public meeting, not on the consent agenda. When it has to do with money and things like that, it's best to just put it there. So that's why this is on the regular agenda. So appreciate it. Any comments or questions from the board? Right. So, I just think, oh, oh, very good. go ahead. So for, for clarification, uh, increased in spending authority. However, does this have any impact on the rates to the customer owners? No, it doesn't. Thank you for the clarification. There you go. Yeah. And, you know, and, and I think it's important to note that this is happening because of the large amount of increased renewables throughout the entire Southwest power pool. There's a lot of it. And all of a sudden, in some area or another, there is absolutely no wind mainly it's wind that we're trying, soon it'll be solar problems, no wind, and all of a sudden somebody's got to hurry up and fire up, it has to be probably, some type of uh, carbon type generation to produce electricity for those people. And that's what we have to buy on the open market all of a sudden. You have to hurry up and buy that. If you can verify that for us and explain it a little bit better. Yes. I'm sort of close, but you know. However, I, I would say that there's, there's another side of, of, of that equation. And I, think, I would say that other side is much, much larger. And that has to do with renewables. Uh, if you bear with me just to explain in, in uh, relatively simple terms, when we are, we are producing uh, almost now, we're at almost one gigawatt, 1,000 megawatts of wind capacity we have in, in, in the region that we have uh, purchase power uh, arrangements with. Um, we're, we're producing. And um, most of those contracts we have with those owners of those farms uh, are, are such that when the wind is blowing, we produce power and we're selling it into the market. A traditional market would typically pay you money when you're producing power. However, there has been so much wind coming from the same region that we have seen many times during the, during the year where we are put, putting in power into the market and instead of getting paid, we actually have to pay the market to take it. That's a, the phenomenon called it's a negative pricing in the market. Thank you. All for good reason. We, we're, we're on, our, on this long journey of decarbonization and adding more renewables, but this is one of the consequences that happen when you have the same type of renewables that are not uh, dispatchable, where you have the same wind, the same technology flowing at the same time, we create sometimes negative pricings, which is one of the reasons why it's co that, that is causing this volatility and this additional expenditure. So all for good reasons, but, but it, it does cost us more money. Now, we can also recover more money. And then, as Director Williams said, we have been uh, able to recover money from the market, and this is not causing any general uh, rate increase. But it is, it is certainly causing us to spend more money than we had the authorization for last year. Which, Javier, by the way, so next year, the budget, we did add in there for the volatility to yeah. cover this because yeah. it's becoming a, yeah. a, a more common occurrence. So this is adjusted for next year's budget. Again, it's your <clears throat> best guess of what's going to happen. You got weather and everything else going on. But so we are adjusting for this and we'll see what happens. But we're, we're all learning as you go. I mean, you got to. It's a new day and we're, we're, we're adapting yeah. to that new reality. And yeah. that's a proposed budget that I presented on Tuesday that will be uh, for yeah. your uh, consideration next month. Yeah, so, so you skimmed over that, but I just, for those in the room, um, we, yes. we got a 
hour long, if not longer, presentation on the 2020 budget yeah, at our Tuesday committee that. meeting. It's available to the public oh, today that's for review, yeah, and we're, we're going to approve it uh, next month. So to yeah. Tim's point, yep. we're making adjustments for next year that incorporate this already. And yeah. you can find that it's the corporate operating plan yeah. is what you what we would like. It's a draft, so we are, we're asking for comments. And Javier will answer all the questions. <laughs> I'll do my best. <laughs> all right. Thanks. If no other questions, is there any? I think we're okay, Javier. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any comments from the public on this matter? Okay, then may we have a vote, Ms. Senators? Bogner? Yes. Kavanaugh? Yes. Gay? Yes. McGuire? Yes. Mulhoff? Yes. Moody? Yes. Williams? Yes. Yoder? Yes. Agenda item 12, power with purpose, procurement of integrated photovoltaic solar and natural gas fuel generation, resolution number 6351. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of Directors of the Omaha Public Power District that, one, the engineer's certification requesting that the board authorize management to negotiate and enter into one or more contracts to provide all engineering, procurement, and construction of natural gas fuel generating facilities and photovoltaic solar facilities and or to acquire capacity and output from the solar facilities and to procure associated local fuel transportation infrastructure without compliance with the sealed bidding provisions of section 70-637 to 70-641 of the Nebraska Rights statute, revised statutes is hereby approved. Two, Management is hereby authorized and directed to negotiate and enter into a contract or contracts with a qualified contractor or contractors to provide all engineering, procurement, and construction of 400 to 600 megawatt AC <coughs> utility scale photovoltaic solar facilities and or to acquire capacity and output from the solar facilities to be integrated with up to 350 megawatts of modernized backup gas field electrical generation equipment and up to 250 megawatts of modernized gas field electrical generation equipment as replacement capacity due to the planned retirement of North Omaha Station Units 1, 2, and 3, and to procure the associated local fuel transportation infrastructure subject to review and approval of the final contracts by the District's General Counsel. Three, the notice required by Nebraska Revised Statutes Section 70-673 shall be published in the Omaha World Herald or other similar newspaper of general circulation. And four, management intends to consult and inform the board throughout the request for proposal process. Through this effort, the board will be knowledgeable about the terms and conditions at a summary level before the contemplated contracts are executed. Do we have a motion? So moved. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, Mr. Yoder. Well, there might be a little interest in this. Um, I, I, you know, there are two big parts on this, and and um, uh, I guess my feeling is so the board is required here to approve the engineer certification, and and I think it's a solid certification that we not go with sealed bid, uh, that this is a complex problem and a complex solution um, that is offered by management, and and certainly. Uh, it makes sense to come to the board with that. Second, then management is seeking authorization um, to secure those services and to award a contract for solar uh, and two different components of natural gas. Um, I, and so those are the kind of the two big things that we are required to approve. What I appreciate here um, is item number four, the management's intent. Um, to come back to the board frequently through this process. So these things don't just happen. Um, there's, <laughs> there, yeah, they don't. Uh, management and, and uh, quite a few of, of OPPD's team um, comes to the board with a, with a recommendation. Um, and so I guess I would give you the opportunity if you wanted to speak to it. Um, otherwise, I can dive in with my personal opinions. Um, about what we should do here. I think there may be some questions that um, some of the directors would like to ask. Okay. If that would be okay. I don't know who would like to start with that. If, um, and probably Mary Fisher would be the one who would be answering this. Um, 
Yeah, so, um, yeah, I have a couple of questions. And actually, it may be uh, our council that may wants to, to answer the first one. Um, so so one, <laughs> one question um, that I have had, I've, I, I, like many of the directors, have, have gone out and spoken with the public um, because it is a sizable project. <laughs> Um, and I, I ended up with two questions, and one question is, is very discreet. Um, it, it is about the uh, delegating the authority of the board to award. So uh, item number two is um, to issue the RFP, to negotiate, and to then award. That's what's being requested by, by management. And uh, many of the public officials I've talked to uh, from mayors to members of the boards of regents to former congressmen to many. When I've asked them this question, I said, this is what they're asking. What do you think? Um, they have suggested that perhaps that giving away the authority to award is something that is unusual for um, elected officials to do. So with that, that's kind of my question. OK. The history. Thank you, Director Yoder, for the question. Uh, as I understand it, you're wondering if <clears throat> it is appropriate under the uh, Nebraska seal bidding statutes for the board to authorize uh, both uh, the negotiation and award of the contract. Is that the question? The resolution as it stands here doesn't necessarily say seal bid, does it? Is that what no, we're talking when about? When I refer to the seal bidding statutes, I'm referring to section 7, gotcha. 637, yes. et cetera, which the board is being asked to waive in order to allow a negotiated process. And the answer to your question is yes. It is appropriate under the statute for the board to authorize management to both negotiate and enter into the contract. As a matter of fact, uh, as I think I pointed out in an earlier meeting, there are two processes that are laid out under that set of statutes. One is the sealed bid statute, which requires the board to approve the award of the contract for sealed bids. The other is the negotiated process, which is the process that is before the board today. And that process requires that the board only approve the engineer certification. It doesn't have a further requirement that, man, that, that the board uh, act any further on a particular contract for which the board is authorized to negotiate a process. It's simply silent on that point. So short answer to your question is it is entirely appropriate under this set of statutes to both negotiate and award uh, the, uh, or allow management to negotiate and award the contract. And as a matter of fact, uh, that has been done on a number of occasions, most recently with respect to the authorization to decommission uh, the Fort Calhoun Nuclear Station, where management was authorized to negotiate and award a very, very significant uh, contract, the result being a significant savings that management has alluded to in closed session uh, for the benefit of the district and its customer owners. So not only is it permissible, but it has, in our experience, resulted in better results. It, yes. And do you mind if I, because I think yeah. there's a, there is a, a differentiating point with public power districts. Clearly in the statutes, and Steve, you may want to stay up just to cover me on this. Uh, sorry, I always have that general counsel close and nearby. Um, and uh, is that the statutes are very clear about public power districts, is that we are to act like a business. Yeah. Correct. And it's a differentiating factor in the statutes of public power than it is for maybe some of the other public municipal uh, entities, uh, Director Yoda, that you spoke of. And so I think that's the differential. And I think the complexity of what we are trying to do uh, and, the, and the multiple kind of levels of that complexity really, um, from our perspectives, uh, gives us the ability to um, leverage the opportunity in negotiations and the balancing of all those elements. Now, uh, my commitment uh, to the board, as I've said a couple times, is that you know we have it in our timeline to come back very clearly and ask for uh, consult, perspective, insight um, as we go through this process, just like we did in the decommissioning process. Um, and I know several board members talked about it on Tuesday, how they felt comfortable um, with that. So I, I think one from the public, you, you need to know this board is going to be kept in form and we'll get that in, input feedback perspective um, and, and their ideas as we move forward, just like we did in decommissioning where we ask some very clear uh, things of the board, is that what do we want to do with our nuclear license? Do we want to give it away to a third party contractor? Do we want to keep it ourselves? Do we want to have a third party 
um, essentially do the deconstruction, but yet we keep it. And what does that look like? And so we we actually asked the board, and my guess is there'll be elements of this. We'll be asking the board to get their feedback, insight, and perspective around. Um, and so I, I know the board understands that, but I think the public needs to understand what the management commitment is uh, to our board on those elements. And, and I, I concur with, with your summary of the law. Uh, public power districts are unique. When the legislature created public power districts, the legislature recognized <coughs> that it was creating an entirely new structure that was replacing privately owned companies that had not done the right kind of job for Nebraskans, frankly. Uh, and so in its wisdom, the legislature adopted a system that, that really did make public power districts run and operate like a business. And the Nebraska Supreme Court has recognized that in the past, uh, finding that public power districts are meant to operate like a business as long as they are dedicating the results of the, of the uh, rates and the revenues that are earned from the rates to, for the benefit of the business and the customer owners of the district. So you're quite right in your assessment of what the law requires and what it allows. Can I, can I ask a follow up on that? Um, I, we had this discussion at length on Tuesday again, and I, but I, I think I want to, I just want to make sure that I have clarity about what the law does and doesn't allow. Sure. Um, not that I'm, not that I'm uncomfortable with what's proposed sure. in terms of uh, because I completely agree, and you've demonstrated from previous activity that that management will keep the board heavily involved. Um, but I just want to make sure I understand the law. Um, you said that the the law is silent with respect to whether or not the board um, should award should step in and award a contract, right? That's correct. So, but but that doesn't prohibit that. No, I would agree. It doesn't prohibit it. Okay. Um, it my, my point is that you have this twofold process. One, where the board for a seal bid is required to approve right. the contract. And the other, the negotiated process, where all the board is asked to do is to approve the engineer certification. Right. No other role is specified. That, that's it, really it my point. It doesn't specify the outcome. So necessary. it would not be prohibited. You're okay. correct. And can you, so thank you for that. And can you talk a little bit more? I think there's a, there's a in addition to... Uh, I think the legitimacy of the argument that a direct negotiate makes all the sense in the world. 100% mm -hmm. agree. Can you talk a little bit about the timing? Um, because I think when we ask sure. this question about, well, could this come back to the board for approval? Um, I recall uh, a, a response that had something to do with how that might delay the timing and how there's a kind of an important date that's out there. Correct. First, this is where I'm going to go to Mary right. uh, very clearly on this, but it, it does tie with some of the regulatory requirements through SPP and the Power Review Board uh, and the, the balance of the two issues that we're talking about here, which is the solar array, the four to 600 megawatts of solar uh, and to up, up, up to 600 megawatts of gas. But Mary, maybe you can speak to the timeline and how this ties into why we need to have things done by April. So we're in the queue. So. Okay. Maybe I'll just start with, um, we have to meet SPP market rules. And as such, part of the open access <coughs> requires us to go in and request an interconnection uh, uh, put in an interconnection request to SPP so that they can study the impact of whatever solution we come up with. SPP has very specific deadlines upon which we must make that uh, known to them in order to get into the study. They do the study, they start the study once a year. And so that deadline is April 30th of 2020. So any interconnection requests that we have that we want to have studied over the next year from April of 2020 to April of 2021 have to be uh, submitted into SPP by April 30th of 2020. Mm -hmm. If we miss that date, we lose one year. Um, and so I just want to be clear about that. That's a market rule that we must adhere to. Um, what we intend on doing, and it was shown in our timeline, the reason that we feel it's, it's very important for us to keep these two uh, the solar and the gas tied together is one to meet that commitment. We need to understand what solar facilities we are going to um, bring into the district, where those are located, and once we understand that location, run it back through our model, do the power flow studies to tell us where the optimal location is for gas. Mm -hmm. All of that must be done before April 30th so that we can put these interconnection requests in. Um, a delay in that, as I said, really pushes us out another year. Now, why couldn't we wait another year? I mean, it's a logical question. Why mm -hmm. wouldn't we wait another year? 
The issue is, is that we have a growing community. And by state statute, I must have enough uh, resources to meet the load of anyone that comes into our service territory. We have the obligation to serve by state statute. So as we think through this, as our growing community um, through economic development and, and just growing, uh, uh, envir growing the, the growing environment around the community, um, it really pushes us to think about how it is that we're going to source the generation that we need in order to meet that obligation to serve. We've gone through uh, a number of months here where we've gone out, we've looked at any number of different technical solutions um, to get us to the point where we are today. We believe that the best technical solution for the district going forward is an integration between solar facilities and gas facilities. And the timeline upon which we need to, to um, uh, the timeline is really driven by this April 30th day in order to get that in, as well as the ramping rates that we're getting from our customers telling us what they think their load is going to be in the future. We tie those things together and we feel like this is definitely the best solution for the district moving forward. Okay. Is from a timing, so, so a little bit deeper on the timing, do we need to go to the power review board before it goes to into the SPPQ? Are those two things connected in any way? No, I don't no? believe they are. Okay. No. All right. And we do have to go to the power review board. Yeah. The power review board will look at what do we believe is the growing load, and we will have to show them that we have enough accredited capacity to meet that growing load. Mm -hmm. um, I can't do that with just solar. Right. I have to do it with the combination of solar and gas. Yeah. And can okay. you expand on that? Because a lot of people were saying, well, how come we just can't use batteries instead, and why do we have to use gas? Right. Um, so there's a couple of questions in there, if I may. Yeah. Um, I had an all-hands meeting this morning at North Omaha, and uh, I had the same question. And I, I really challenged the team up there to go out and speak to their, to their neighbors, to their community, to the people that, that we serve each and every day within our footprint. And I explained it to them this way because I want them to be knowledgeable and I want them to understand and to really be the face of the company um, because they, they really do need to do that. They, they're much broader in the community than any of us here in this room. And this is the way I explained it to them. Accredited capacity is a simple math problem. It's a simple addition problem. There are market rules in which SPP has set forth how much accredited capacity I can have for each technology solution. So a gas turbine at 100 megawatts will get an accredited capacity of 100 megawatts because it's dispatchable, it's available at uh, all times of the year. Um, certainly we do have outages, but again, it's available when we need it, and that is at our peaks. Um, a solar facility, we'll talk about a solar facility, um, and I'll talk about it in general terms. Um, SPP is still working on the rules. We believe that the capacity for a solar facility is, is going to land somewhere between 50 and 65 percent. Um, so if you take a solar facility, you take 100 megawatts of solar, just to use the same example, that only gets an accredited capacity of 50%. Also, because solar is not dispatchable and is not necessarily there in our peak, especially in the winter, um, it gets zero accredited capacity during the winter months. Um, and people ask, why is that? Well, let's think about that. We have holiday season coming up. Our peaks are typically in December. And why is that? Because people are bringing on holiday lights. And when do you bring them on? When you get home in the evening at 6 o'clock, well, it's dark. There is no solar. And so you're looking at your peak and how that, how that technology is responding to your peak demand, whether it be in the winter or the summer. And so in the, in, in the winter, solar gets virtually zero uh, capacity accredited to it. Yes. I'm sorry, can you, can you clarify that the accredited capacity requirement from SPP, the 12% reserve margin, um, is not just once annually, but it is at different times throughout the year. So there is a separate requirement in the winter where solar receives no credit. Is that, Correct. Is that right? It's always, it's always your peak plus 12%, and you have seasonal peaks. You have a, a summer and a winter peak. Great. Thank you. Uh -huh. and, the, and the rule is 12%. You have to have 12% margin above that. 
Um, if you look at the wind, for example, that we have, the wind blows pretty much all year round, but wind only gets accredited at about 15%. So our 1,000 megawatts of wind, I can only credit about 150. So as you start to add these up, again, it's a simple addition problem. It's the gas generation that is going to remain there for the future, which is why we are saying we need to have this accredited capacity. I gave him the example today. Um, I, I was at, at, the, at the plant, and the sun was shining in the windows, and I said, you know what? A solar facility would be producing electricity today, but it's not accredited. And it's not accredited because our peak typically is in the evenings when you go home and it's cold, and you turn on your lights, you put your heater up, you want to make it warm, you, you go in and you, and you cook your dinner. And so um, when you're looking at accredited capacity, it's really looking at how those different technologies are sourcing <coughs> your peaks. You have to add all of those up, plus 12%. That's what I need to have on the system in order to meet the SPP market rules. That answer your question? That answer my question. Director Director question. Can I follow up on, uh, I'm sorry, a terminology question, because you've said accredited capacity a number of times, and mm -hmm. that's related to SPP's 12% reserve margin requirement. There's another term that we've, correct? That's it, what we're looking for? Accredited capacity is not just the 12%, but it's it's your peak plus 12%. Peak. I'm sorry, thank you. Yeah. Um, it, separately, we've also talked about another term, which is capacity factor. Mm -hmm. And I think the words are similar enough that as we talk through them, can you explain a little bit what that term means um, separate? Because it, it is relevant here also. Um, and then follow up with describing what we expect for capacity factor on uh, each of the types of assets that we're getting. Because these are totally separate terms. The one that we need, we are required to meet is the accredited capacity. Correct. But the capacity factor, the delivered energy, is, is different. Can you help us with that? Right. I think you just defined it, right? Capacity we, factor is yeah. the delivered energy that we can, we can expect out on the system. So today I have capacity factors at our units. Um, I think, and, and I'm going to report on. And he will. <laughs> I was going to say our president on reports on it monthly. Um, what you see, if I can, if I can go to uh, as an example, North Omaha, you'll see that those capacity factors are down in probably the 60% range. We do that intentionally um, because we have low loads at night, and so we back off our generation yeah, in the evening in order to save on our emissions. So we operate our facilities in an environmentally sensitive manner. So the capacity factor is what we would expect to come in, but accredited capacity is how you add up the capacity that's available to meet your peak plus 12%, and that's driven by the SPP market. And from the types of technology that we're talking about moving forward, yes, each month we see a report from President Burke about um, what we've seen in the past, two types of technology, solar and generally combustion turbines <coughs> on, the, on the gas assets. Um, can you give us a projection on what we think might be the uh, capacity factor on those resources moving yeah. forward? Right. I'll talk a little bit about our, our current uh, fleet, our current yeah. peaking fleet. Um, it, historically, they've been in kind of the 1% to 2% uh, capacity factor range. Really, that high, high peak in the summer, the, the hottest days of the summer is where we need those. And that, that's kind of 1% to 2%. Over the last uh, year, I would say, we've seen some of those kind of bump up to 5 or 6%. Um, between 4 and 6%, I guess, is, is where I would put that. So we're seeing that they are being utilized more as an integration tool for the renewables or the intermittent, uh, intermittency of renewables that are coming on the system, or the generation, the baseload generation that has been retired in the region. And so we're seeing more use of our peaking generation. Um, so what we put into our analysis was we thought that the, they could be, in the future, up closer to about the 10% uh, range. And so that's what we used in our analysis. It's a projection. Um, and, and that's really what we're thinking is, is that our, our, gen our uh, gas generation that we want to bring on will be operating about 10% of the time is what we're projecting today. Can you divide up the gas generation? There's actually two different parts to that gas generation. We had a commitment that we made in 2016 on North Omaha to turn right now um, one, two, and three are on gas and four and five are on coal. Our commitment is by 2023-24 to shut down one, two, and three completely and to change North Omaha 4 and 5 to gas. This is a different type of gas engine. A lot of people, a lot of the commenters said, this is a strand that assets all this new gas. Can you talk about the gas 
technology that we'd be using here and how it is not stranded technology as far as yeah. you consider? Yeah, and, and I think I alluded to it a little bit is what we're seeing uh, in the marketplace is the ability of our quick ramping facilities, which is generally our peaking fleet, to be utilized to, to help integrate uh, the wind and the solar that we're seeing coming on in the SPP footprint. It's that fast ramping, so as the wind starts to die down, you can bring those units up to cover, cover what you need on the system. Um, you also see um, what happens is sometimes the wind gets too strong. And when the wind gets too strong, they actually have to cut off the wind in order to protect the equipment. And so you'll see a, a definitely, you know, your, your wind is operating at a very high level and then all of a sudden it drops off very quickly. Um, and so what we do is we bring on our peaking generation to cover that. So North Omaha 1, 2, and 3 are currently operating only on gas. Uh, we were, in 2014, made the commitment to retire those in 2016. We actually retired those units for about a month and a half while we were trying to make the decision around Fort Calhoun. And the decision around Fort Calhoun really led us to go back and say, we need that capacity, accredited capacity in this case, on the system. And the cheapest way to keep that for the district was to actually keep units one, two, and three operational and to only operate those on gas. Um, and so we've been doing that since, since 2016. Um, and it, it is cheap capacity on, on the system. We want to operate in an environmentally sensitive manner. And so we do have the commitment to retire those by the end of, of 2023. And we also have the commitment to convert North Omaha 4 and 5 to gas by the end of 2023. So on January 1st, 2024, the North Omaha station um, emissions will be reduced by about 80 to 90 percent through these actions. Say that again. Because this is huge. North <laughs> the Omaha North is Omaha station that. emissions will be reduced by about 80 to 90 percent redu reduction in carbon. Um, emissions, I should be specific, in carbon emissions, emissions uh, by January 1st, 2024, through these actions. Overall, our generating fleet, the carbon that is be being emitted into the uh, uh, environment today, overall from about 2010 to uh, January 1st of 2024, we will have reduced our carbon emissions by 30%. Um, and so it is a significant reduction in carbon emissions uh, through these actions that we intend to take. Other questions? So, uh, so um, those numbers, 2010 to 2024, um, so can you give us an idea of round millions metric tons annually? Because we started that uh, carbon emission reporting uh, with the SD7 previous update and then backtracked a couple of years. Currently around 11 and a half million metric tons, is that right? The reduction? I'm sorry, the total uh, emission um, last year was around 11 and a half, is that right? Uh, I'm going to point Maybe that's what's about 10. <clears throat> that's what I would say. It's and, about 10. Yeah. And then projected by 2024, we have a, a round number uh, with, with that 30% reduction? About seven. About seven. I would say seven. 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 So we seven. project about 7 million metric tons per year by 2024. Correct. Great. Thank you. Total. Yeah. Total. Thank you. <laughs> total, total. That's why I have the crowd here. <laughs> We appreciate you, Russ, by the way. <laughs> so, Mary, if we, can, if we just delay this project and continue to operate North Omaha for another year, how many metric tons per year would we we'd be adding to our footprint? Um, so would, would that be about three? I mean, if we're going from 10 to 7, would that be about three? Per year. Million, three. Three. Per year. Three. How, Ton, per year. Three million tons? Three, three million tons per year. Per year. So <laughs> delaying this decision by another year adds significant amounts of carbon to our um, and, footprint. And, and, and that's why we're asking for the ability to negotiate an award, because we are really trying to meet that April 30th deadline. Um, and these are very integrated. As I said, until I know where the solar assets are, it does me no good to run a power flow study. We need to run the power flow studies to understand the best places to put our gas assets. These are very intertwined, um, which is why you see it, us calling it an integrated solution. It is a single solution to meet the problem that we have, and that is to serve the obligation to serve our growing communities. 
So if I, just to be precise here, you mentioned it's a sequential process, however. It so is. you won't be able to, to do those models until you've got information back on the solar. Is that correct? That's correct. Right. And, and that will take some time. And that will take some time. That's and just correct. to clarify further on that, power flow study will also inform gas size as well? Yes, it will. Okay. Yes, it will. Size, location, Size, technology. Size, location, and yep. technology. Yep. Okay. And that's why the resolution's written as up to. Yes. Up to. Up to. That no is correct. Greater. That is correct. Thank and you. I think some early conversation was, does gas mean combined cycle, which no. operates 24 hours a day like a baseload plant? And the answer is no, it's not. It's this 5 to 10 percent kind of peak generation that we right. use to stabilize the system or for peak loads to meet our accreditation. Right. And, and, and when I talk about peaking generation, as I said, you know, it's really that integrator or the intermittent generation that we're bringing on in terms of, of wind and solar. It's really providing kind of a solid base for us to be able to operate for, uh, to operate with. And that really helps us to project forward for what we want to do in the decarbonization study. If we have that solid base, it really gives us a way to analyze this and to give us more options uh, to look at going forward, and I, I believe, um, you know, one of the things that we can that we need to look at is, does that how does that going to affect the timing of what we need to do? Um, and so, um, I really do believe, and I've I've said this, I said it at the committee meeting, and I, I I've said it last month. I do believe that what we're doing here is the springboard forward to help really push forward the uh, decarbonization study that we've talked a lot about. Uh, since June of this year. So I want to I want to come back to that, but I want to ask about batteries first. Okay, okay. Right. Um, so I'm sorry, Next question. can I jump in here, Craig? Because I have a specific, we, we, I'm sorry, Craig. Yeah, no, sorry. jump in there. So springboard to decarbonization, we've talked about a couple times. Can you highlight some of the possibilities that would be available to us through the decarbonization study with these resources that would not be available to us without these resources during that study? Yeah, I, I don't know that it wouldn't be available to us. I think it might be available to us in a broader sense. What I really want to do in the decarbonization study is to really have a broad, open, um, let's talk about all um, technologies that are out there and really evaluate those. So anything from you know carbon capture and sequestration or just carbon capture um, to how do we operate Jones Street or not operate Jones Street to can we seasonally operate Nebraska City One to what other technologies are out there like uh, demand side resources, energy efficiency, microgrids, batteries, all of those technologies, I think it opens the door for us to consider how best to utilize those going forward. And having the accredited capacity from both the solar and the new gas turbines would allow us to have more choices there. It gives us the flexibility to bring those in is what I would say, right? Because we need to have that solid base. And that really gives us that springboard that I keep talking about. It gives us a solid base to, to really be able to look at those things and how we might integrate them going forward. Great. Thank you. Sorry, Greg. Battery question. No problem. Um, so, yeah, uh, I think it's fair to say a lot of the comments that we received from the public were, why can't batteries solve this problem? Um, so can you can you just kind of elaborate a little bit? We've, we've talked about it extensively as a board, but I want to... Absolutely. I want you to describe it again, please. Okay, I'll be happy to. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about technology. Um, I'll go back to the spring of this year. In the spring of this year, we had a significant flood. Uh, flooded Fort Calhoun, came down the river. North Omaha Station is built up higher, and so we had no um, operational issues at, uh, at North Omaha. But you went down to Nebraska City, and Nebraska City has a levee that goes around it. The levee was actually breached, um, and it came over top of the levee, so the water was high enough to come over the top of the levee. Um, went down in and did some scour holes that were anywhere from you know five to eight to, to nine feet deep. Um, I'm happy to say that we're repairing that, um, and we're really close to having it having it repaired, and and I hope it'll be repaired by the by the end of the year. But having said that, um, we actually shut down both units. We were in a, a uh, uh, outage at Nebraska City One. We shut shut down the outage and all of the a activities. Planned outage, right? A planned yeah. outage. Thank you. <coughs> um, it, we shut down all the activities there in order to protect the workforce. Um, we also let all non-essential uh, people go home, and we shut down Nebraska City Two. So our largest generating units were uh, taken off the grid. Um, 
trying to protect, one, the facility, but also our workers. We didn't want to have any excess personnel that we didn't have to. Um, I will tell you, uh, if, if circumstances had not gone the way that they had, that probably the, it would have been breached and uh, the road coming in and out of the facility would have been flooded. And, and that was really the concern. It was the, the coming in and going out of the facility. Mm -hmm. Um, I tell you all of this because at that time um, there was flooding going up and down the river. It wasn't just affecting our units. It was, you know, there were there were concerns all over up and down the river. Um, SPP was very concerned. Uh, NEMA was very concerned, um, as they should be. And uh, we actually brought on uh, North Omaha units one, two, and three as peaking generation to have available uh, should we need it. We also operated. Uh, all of our facilities and our peaking stations um, for a number of days continuously. I'm not staffed for that. Uh, people really lived and breathed their passion to serve. Um, they came in, you know, worked from midnight to, to uh, six, and six to midnight. Um, it, was, it, was, it was phenomenal what they did. The answer to the battery question is, if I'd had batteries, I could have used the batteries, which will last from four to eight hours, depending on, on the battery type, but I wouldn't have had the power to recharge them mm -hmm. because everything I had was already going to the grid to support our, our load. Mm -hmm. Those peaking units ran for multiple days continuously. The batteries would have been gone in four to eight hours. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about resiliency of the system, <clears throat> That is the resiliency that we're trying to maintain on the system. And that's why this is critically important that we keep these two interconnected. Um, we want to make sure that we maintain the level of, of resiliency that we have to get through significant multi-day events. And is there accredited capacity for batteries? Um, today, the tariff uh, at SPP does, is silent on batteries. There is not accredited capacity for batteries in the tariff today. FERC has ordered SPP to put that into their tariff, but it'll likely be a year, two year and a half, maybe two years before we see that language to know what the accredited capacity for batteries would be. Hmm. Mr. Lang? Okay. <laughs> um, can, you, can you talk about um, what we are looking at for batteries um, outside of this? But this is, I mean, <laughs> just like in yeah. 2000, uh, middle 2000, we were looking at wind. We're in kind of a similar position for batteries today. Can you highlight what we've got going now? Right. A couple of things. As, as we go out for the solar contract, we made it very clear that we want them to be battery capable. Um, and so that, that takes into some design um, um, parameters that we have to pay attention to. So that's one thing. The other thing is, is that we've gone out for a grant. And um, that grant we should hear by? Initially April. April. Um, and it, it's, I believe, a month, one, one, megawatt. one megawatt battery that we would like to get a grant. Um, we're asking for 50% of that to be um, uh, funded by the grant. OPPD will fund the other 50%. Um, it's important for us to get batteries on our system. I want to be clear about that. They have a place. They definitely have a place. We want them to come into the system, but we want, to we want them to come in a system where we can actually study them, monitor them, understand them, make sure that we are putting them in the best place to get the greatest benefit for the district going forward. So it is something that we're very focused on. Um, I will also tell you that I think batteries are still very expensive. Uh, we talked about the wind contract and how flat water being the first was the most oh, expensive. expensive. We want to wait hat. until the battery uh, costs come down a bit. Um, and so that's why we're going after a grant to really help with the, the cost of that. We need them on our system. We want them on our system. It'll be part of the decarbonization study, but they're not the answer to the multi-day resiliency problem that we see uh, should we not put sort of an integrated solution in place. I agree that we need them on our system. Um, and I also would like to point out that as we're discussing the corporate operating plan, uh, I don't believe that all of our innovation needs to be grant funded. And so mm -hmm. I would like to be, as we look to next month's discussion, prepared that in the event that we do not receive a grant fund, that we can still um, find a way to incorporate that project anyway, <coughs> because it is important to make take the first step so that in future resource planning discussions, we have experience on our system with batteries so we know how to incorporate them when FERC and SPP have guidelines for us and we can make that, uh, make that a part of uh, where we're headed moving forward. Yeah, I would just echo that. Just don't let the grant owner know that you, or else they're not going to give it to us. <laughs> <clears throat> I hope they're not listening. <laughs>
Well, I don't have any uh, more questions, but I just I have a couple comments that, that I'll share. I think um, the team has put a tremendous amount of time mm. and energy and passion into solving for the problems that we have. Mm -hmm. And the board has, has painstakingly reviewed all the information and provide a very rigorous list of questions for you guys to address. And so thank you very much for that effort. Um, I think this process has highlighted for us the need to refine and reflect SD9, the resource planning um, strategic directive, to really ensure that future initiatives investments align fully with OPBD's missions. Not that this doesn't, but I think we just need a, a uh, to put, I guess, a bigger framework around how do we evaluate um, future investments in generation? How do what does environmentally sensitive really mean? And really engage the public and make sure that um, our customer owners have a really strong say in defi helping define the solutions and mm -hmm. and how we measure and um, and evaluate all of those decisions. So thank you so much for for the efforts that you you and your team have put into this hearing. <coughs> You know, Director Bogner, I would just say, you know, with 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 the previous um, item on SD7, I mean, we have a different North Star as we're moving into the decarbonization pathway initiative. It's a different North Star than we had a month ago, even though we've been talking about it. And so as we kind of go through it, there is a North Star of net zero by 2050. And um, and so I think you will you will see that mm -hmm. as we begin to think about resource planning. What does that look like, and what are some of those trade offs right. that we need to engage not only the board but the public on those trade offs to make sure everyone understands what they are. And so I think we'll have that opportunity to be able to do that in that process. No doubt. I, thank you. Yeah. yeah I, I think the other thing is is that that is currently part of the plan for decarbonization, that we will go out and and really talk to the stakeholders up front to help us um, uh, to help us define what the parameters are around which we want to uh, model this going forward. So um, we've been talking a lot about that. How do we put that together? What, what stakeholders do we need to bring in? You know, how do we help, how do we get them to help us scope this? Because we will have to put some parameters around it so that we can model it effectively. Um, but it's really going to be with that stakeholder process and then the board um, helping us to, to define that scope early on so that as we do the analysis, we get to the answers that people are looking for. Yeah. You know, but I, I do want to mention, though, that you did look at the environmental impacts on this. When you're looking at generation, we could well, you could well have offered us a lot less expensive option. Absolutely. But yeah. that option had a lot higher Full carbon. Yeah, sure. And I think the public should know that we could have we could have easily had a you know a less expensive option, but we have mandated them to be environmental sensitivity <clears throat> is in that, and I think I commend you for that. And at the same time, we want to mention that there is no rate increase with this too. So again, we appreciate all the work on that. Well, and can I just respond to that comment? Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I think environmental sensitivity in the way that, that we're thinking about it right now is very much related to carbon. But one of the things that came up in closed session, and I hope I can say this, <laughs> is, so. is related to how we're, how we're procuring land to do these things and oh, and different. the site okay, selection you're doing, aspects. you're doing future. Okay, I'm so, sorry. Yeah. yeah, and that's yeah. what I mean by really evaluating what, and, and putting very specific language to what does it mean to be environmentally sensitive and how are we evaluating? And that goes to, I mean, we needed to find the what, right? And you have to deliver on the how. And so I think that that, that is something that will, mm -hmm. that in concert yeah, together, we need to really provide very clear Good example. Def def Thank you. definitions about what it means to be environmentally sensitive. Huh. Good example. Mr. Cavanaugh. Yeah, and, um Relinquishing our voting authority is not something, you know, to be taken lightly. Uh, the reasons for needing to do so were, were laid out clearly both Tuesday as well as, as today. And clearly the proposed process is necessary to, for the success of this resolution. Um, as you mentioned, we could have gone cheaper. Could have. And, uh, uh, but we're still been assured that this uh, resolution will not result in a general rate increase. And that's for that reason. And, for the reasons uh, management has pointed out, I, I will support it. 
Mr. Yoder? So I don't know that I have any questions, but I have comments. Um, but feel free to respond. Um, so to start off, great work. You know, kudos for helping our customers and, and really every single Nebraskan to have something to crow about. Um, the utility scale solar is, is going to be talked about, I think, quite a bit as people move into the holiday season and go across the country and try to find something else to talk about besides the Huskers. Um, <laughs> so this really gives them that, something to be proud of. And, and I personally am proud um, of, to know the team that put that together. Uh, without question, that part of this resolution is something that I support. Um, I also support, definitely, uh, the not to exceed 250 megawatts at North O. Um, that was a goal set up in 2014, and, and I'm happy that our board can, can, um, can put the stamp on that and, and help management make that move forward. Um, so I'm very happy about that, and I feel very good about how it reduces risk to human health and the environment. If I may, just one point of clarification. Sure. Not necessarily at North Omaha. And, ah, and, thank and the only you. reason I'm well, going to say so that is... Let, let's talk about it as a replacement. Yes, as a for, replacement, yeah, yeah. yes. Thank you. I just want to be careful because yep. I know we have a number of employees watching this, and they're going to take that comment and say, oh, yay. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be clear that we do not know where these yeah. will be well, located. Which is why you were wise not to sit down. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, again, I'm very proud to know the members of the team <laughs> and, and all the work that's been done on both of those things. I worry a little bit, though, um, as is my want. Um, uh, you know, I fear we're locking in um, a mistake um, with, the, with the 350. Um, I think it's prudent. I'm not proposing that we postpone the whole thing. Um, I, but I think it would be prudent for the board to take just a little more time, maybe a month, maybe two months. I think that's within the timeline that you have for gathering information to be absolutely sure that we fulfill our duty of care, our fiduciary responsibilities, and our obligation to seek and receive informed public consent. Um, <coughs> I don't want to look back in six years and say that we, we built 350 megawatts of natural gas that, and it, it does end up being a stranded asset because I think the reports that people are seeing are you are exactly right mostly about combined cycle, but if you listen to podcasts with the report authors and you read into, the, into those reports, they do also talk about peaking units. So as being potentially stranded within the normal lifetime. So the board does have an easy way to do this. We could, um, it's a way that's suggested by the project timeline. Um, it would be uh, responsible and sensible to uh, for us to delay part of this so that we can critically consider power with a purpose on future boards and our customer owners. You know, hurried decisions are by definition not thoughtful decisions. And I, I and yes, you are so right. There were a lot of questions we asked. You guys, we put in time to put them together. You put in a lot of time to answer the questions. But when we hurry, we're subject to the frailties of the brain logic or illogic that, that we all have. The brain can force us to be driven by fear. Um, there are a couple of Nobel Prizes on deciding. Daniel Kahneman, an economist, talks about uh, anchoring. Uh, Eleanor Ostrom talks about the rationality of an enterprise interest actually being detrimental to the larger community. Right? These are things that we're thinking that don't let us be, think as critically as we possibly should. We're often attracted to the novelty of a shiny new object. We trust the shortcut of the trusted messenger, which you are a trusted messenger. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> By social influence and the need to do what we see others doing. Um, by the comfort of familiar solutions over innovative options, going with the flow of default options, um, using the lens of straight line assessments rather than being able to see what's happening in an exponential curve kind of world. We got rapid change and we don't always look at it right. And if we don't take enough time, 
which I think we need, um, we're more likely to have reflexive decisions than reflective decisions. So we talked about all of the energy that we're generating to meet the, the demand, but our mission is not to deliver energy. Our mission is to, live, to deliver energy services. And so when we lock in to delivering energy, we're kind of excluding the opportunity for a business model that focuses on energy services. And I think we do have the opportunity to reduce the demand that creates the need for us to build all of this generation. And I have confidence in the team, right? I think if we had come to them and said, hey, we like this solar deal, we like this change out that affects North Omaha but may not be it. Um, here, I'll take a drink at that. And just ask them, um, what would a non-natural gas alternative look like? Or something even with a less lower dependence on natural gas? Um, I, I think they would have come up with a solution. Rick, that wouldn't be the same solution. Up? This is your committee's uh, uh, project. <coughs> did you bring this up during <coughs> committee discussion with, uh, with management then? Uh, where, where are we going with I, th this? I think we have had, well, where I'm going with this is asking the board, potentially, their ideas for waiting for more information. I'm pointing out that there is a need for more information. Are you proposing an amendment? Nope. I'm asking for discussion. Thank you. I would you like for to say if we would, uh, ex I, I think uh, Director Mohoff actually, actually asked that question. If we delay this, what would be the effect as far as North Omaha? But I think I specifically said that I, not to delay the entire thing, but to delay for two months, let two thirds of this project move forward. I think uh, I, I may take this if you don't mind. Sure. Well, I, th I think it's easy to clap on that. <clears throat> I think it's easy to clap on that. Sure, everybody would love to clap And on that. I'm just going to go back to um, February of this year where, where we shared with the board what this customer demand and growth is going to look like. And we did it in a closed session and said, here's, here's the impact to our system. Here's the load. Here's what it looks like. We are spending time and energy to begin to think about how we begin to drive the capacity that we're going to need, just what Mary said, right? Peak load plus 12%. But we also have ongoing growth that's occurring on our system, right? This region continually grows and will continue to grow, right? It's in the, it's in the right kind of spot of the region. We also took the board through very, very deep understanding around reliability, around resiliency, around rates 101, rates 201, uh, and reliability. And I might have said resource planning. One, to set up the conversation and the discussion that we knew we were going to have. And so I, I would, the only thing I would say, Director Yoder, is that this isn't a wanton and fast decision on behalf of the senior management team. We've been focused on this need based on some of the growth issues that we knew that we were going to be have. We didn't know maybe the extent. We didn't know if it was going to be X 100 megawatts or X plus 100 megawatts. But we knew we had North Omaha in the foreground, and we made the assumption we are going to live up to our commitment to the folks in North Omaha that we made in 2014. And so when, when, when you say it's been a quickened and fast analysis, I would absolutely say it has not been. Now, you're right. I, I would say when we came to the board in October, you know, we said we would like, or excuse me, in September, we had a conversation. We'd like to get approval in October because of the, uh, the board's concern and issue um, around stakeholder involvement and input um, and the limited options that we had, that we did look at, that we did review, we felt we were really in a spot where I've already delayed this 30 days. And delay this out for 20 days puts us at risk in filing the needed information that we need to have at SPP and to move through the process. And when I disconnect these, when I disconnect these, I have issues at the Power Review Board, I have issues at SPP, I have issues on our system. And so I, I would, I, I understand your concerns. You've been, to me, you've been incredibly clear <laughs> on what your expectation is. And I understand yeah. it, but for this problem and this situation, I think we've done 
yeoman's work on due diligence around this issue, not just with us, but with our vendors, with uh, subject matter experts on solar, on battery, on, on those kinds of impacts. And I would say we feel very comfortable that, one, I can live up to no general rate increase. I can live up to maintaining our reliability in this region, right? Um, so rates, reliability. And as we talked about, 90% reduction at the North Omaha campus of reducing carbon emissions. And when I go to natural gas, I reduce other emissions too, right? Very clearly. Um, and so allow us the opportunity to step through this decarbonization analysis and initiative for a longer term strategy that, that isn't wanton and neglectful, right? And I know we had discussions at the board meeting about, well, you know, we, you can take care of 75% of these issues with certain kind of technologies, but I can't think about a solution of 75%. I got to think about a solution of 100% of our customers' needs. And so um, I, I would ask, um, and, and Director Yoder, I, I apologize for pontificating here, but I think it's important for the audience to know the conversation and the discussion that we've had around resiliency, reliability, and resource planning. So three quick yeah, points. Rick, Rick, you asked for discussion. I'd like, to, discussion I'd like to follow up a little bit on this, too. You. Just as a member of the board for all of us, I think you're painting a picture that isn't accurate, I'd say. I think there's been thousands and thousands of hours worked at this, let's face it. And I commend, and I've said this many times in public, and I've told all of you, I commend the board for asking all these digging questions. Mm -hmm. There are pages and pages and pages out there on the website that anyone could look at. And I know today's the, the day where the final vote's coming up, but I think it's, you know, to say we didn't put the time in, I'm not gonna repeat everything that Tim said, but you all know, we're elected to try to gather very complex information and make the best decision on behalf of our ratepayer constituents. And I think we've all done that. To say, oh, let's delay it just a little bit more and risk something, I, I think is wrong. I, and you said you're not going to have an amendment. I don't think we should have an amendment. But like I say, I, I look at that and I say, well, all the time and effort and energy that everyone, the staff and everyone and the, and the board members have put into it, I, I say, let's go. I'm sure this public would, they've been sitting here for an hour and a half or whatever, and we're, while we're well, like talking about things, I'd like to hear what they say too, because I think that's a process. Let's, yeah. let's hear. I would like to uh, sort of bring this out to a public comment if there's not another board member. Janice, would you like to say something? Yes, so I just wanted to say one, one thing here. We got a lot of comments, and I know that a lot of you here are wanting to comment about how we should not go forward with any new fracked gas um, assets. I was talking to um, Mr. Fernandez before this meeting. There are 300,000 customers, probably residential customers in our district, who use fracked gas as a, as a primary fuel source for their heat during the winter. So this will probably not be a stranded asset. Um, and if it is, everyone in the district will be paying the same. And the, the money that, and if we do have to run this um, unit, the market rate for the power that we're producing will reflect the market rate for the gas. So um, I think calling it fracked gas keeps reminds us that it's not easy or cheap to get that gas to these units, and it will drive us to make sure that we're using these units in a way that is prudent and efficient and the best use of the technology. But these gas units can also be refueled to other types of fuel and other types of gas that's not fracked gas, that's not the gas that you're um, protesting against. And so we appreciate your comments. It helps us to think about it, to look for other um, options. And when we do the RFP, that will be included as part of the RFP as an option for um, refueling these or a type of turbine that can be um, can use an alternative fuel source or can be refueled in the future to use another fuel source if natural gas gets to be too expensive or um, you know it's just not working so I, I, I just wanted to make that comment we we need you to tell us what you how you're feeling about these things um, but sometimes we have to think a little deeper and because of your comments, we've adjusted the RFP to, to include um, 
other fuel sources for these combustion turbines. So um, we would just ask that you would, you know, give us a chance to. Well, I think they should. Yeah, we have do a, listen. They, Excuse me, Mr. Yoder. I did not call you. I well, no, you Mr. didn't. But I, well, did, I, I think know, I do. I, I, I do Moody, deserve to make a rebuttal. Yeah, but Mr. Moody also had asked to talk. So okay, let's have sure. Mr. Moody make yeah, a I'll be. I'll be quick. Um, before we go to public comment, uh, Rick asked to, Director Yoder. Sorry, I did That's asked right. a question for a conversation. I just want to respond to that. Um, uh, I have every faith that the team has put in the right level of work to get us the information we need. I, I, I don't know. There's always another rock to overturn, right? Like there's always more information and there, you can always wait for new data to come in. Um, but in terms of the question that you're asking, which I haven't finished asking, <laughs> I think you hinted at it, right? um, it's, you know it's, it it's my view that I think we've, uh, I, I, I'm ready to make a decision at some point today. Thank you. Um, and, don't feel. I, I think. It, I think there are other risks that it, that that it presents for us. So I'm. I'm. In terms of waiting, I'm uncomfortable with that. Sure. Okay. Here it is. So yeah. <clears throat> Rel uh, yep. Um, related to uh, Director Yoder's point about um, specifically the time. Yes, staff has put in thousands, tens of thousands of hours. Um, but in reflecting back on that. Um, the board has had about two months to review the specific details after the closed session, and then the public has had about one month. And so looking forward, frequently we have heard that the decarbonization study will be the next step. And so I'm looking forward to seeing public engagement through the decarbonization study on the order of something like a quarterly report that gives an opportunity for direct input from the public throughout the process so that by the time we get to the end of that report and we know what some of our options are moving forward, it doesn't feel to our customer owners as if gee, this has come to the end and now we're just presenting you the answer, but that there has been sufficient and ongoing direct engagement throughout the entire process to avoid some of the concerns that we've, uh, that we've heard echoed in some of the comments here today. Uh, as final comments um, about the overall process in general, this is, in summary, this is in general a very large investment in utility scale solar first. Um, for our comparison, if you look online, it looks like about uh, 579 megawatts is the largest utility scale solar project in the United States right now. If we end up at the top of this range, that would mean that we would be constructing the largest solar facility in the country. So that's kind of the first component of this project. Um, secondly, these resources follow through on the pledge to shut off units one, two, and three and remove coal from North Omaha in four and five, which is a pledge that was made in 2016 but did not have any specific steps for implementation. I think it's important to remember that we are following through on that commitment to remove coal from North Omaha um, with these resources. Um, we've also talked about how these resources provide flexibility for future decarbonization. I think that's a big component of what we're talking about here today. Uh, and that this, these resources will not cause a general rate increase. So I think those are some of the key foundations that we need to be evaluating as we make this vote today. Um, there are timelines outside of our control which must be met, which we highlighted earlier. And so regarding the idea of separating or delaying component of that, I think staff has provided some really great clarification on what the timelines are and, uh, and why this is presented simultaneously for approval on both um, moving forward toward that April deadline. Uh, to be perfectly clear, I wish that we were not presented with something that was a gas asset, uh, that we were not looking at new gas generation. Um, I wish that were true. Uh, however, uh, I don't think that we have other options today that can meet the needs that we are trying to solve for. Uh, we, have, we have been bound by past decisions that did not at the time fully recognize the consequences that we would be asked to address now. So the decision at Fort Calhoun was the right decision at the time. The decision in 2016 with North Omaha, again, I think it was, was the right decision at the time. New load growth in our territory, again, I think is the right decision and an obligation. But at each of those decision points, we did not fully recognize that at a future time, we would be asked to do something just like what we're doing today. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important that as we look forward through the decarbonization and through reach future resource planning that we'll address with SD9, um, that we go looking forward, we go into it understanding what the potential consequences are in future, in future decisions. So um, overall, a decrease of 90% at North Omaha in carbon emissions, 30% through our entire utility, um, and an investment in extremely large utility scale solar with the gas backup, backup to back our intermittent wind and solar. Um, I understand the reasons for this proposal. I understand the reasons for it to be bound together. Uh, I understand the commitments of staff moving forward, and I'm looking forward to hearing what the public has to say about this proposal and, uh, and, and future actions. 
I appreciate your Thank summarization you. of the proposal. Mr. Yoder, you have to you I, have another question. Director, thank you, Director McGuire. Director Williams hit the point um, that in 2014, when there was a generation consideration and it was put to the public, it was issued in, it started in February. It came back to the board in the, the public, uh, the request for public information. It started in February. This is according to the supplementary documents of 6006. It came back to the board in May, the results of that. Uh, and then the board voted on it in June. So uh, I just wanted to double down on the fact that this has been very, sh yes, certainly, President Burke, you guys have put in a lot of time. And again, I have confidence that you've, you've mm -hmm. given a good solution. I'm just not always confident that we've asked the right question, okay. right? So are we doing, we're creating energy. I don't know that we're doing the energy services options that we could be doing. That's my main point. Um, as for asking for more time, Wednesday of next week, I will be at a DOE um, uh, workshop uh, to talk about resiliency, to defi help define resiliency. Workshop with utilities, with regulators around the country. Happy to see other people from OPPD there. Um, but one of the questions are, you know, are we gold plating when we have our definitions of resiliency? Certainly we do have to have resilient uh, systems for our critical services, be they medical, be they First National Bank, credit card, be whatever. But we should not build so large Gosh. that right. no we are trying to do uh, resiliency for everybody. And so is there a way to s squeeze down on, on that? It's like we talked about a car uh, and negotiating for a car. You know, when I was young, we had full-size um, spare tires, um, and then they got to be donuts, and now they don't even have spare tires. So can we, in the services that we need, reduce the size of the gas generation? That's what I'm hoping for. Okay, thank you. I would uh, now like to bring this yeah. to uh, an option for the public to make comments. Uh, Dave Corbin, uh, 1002 North 49th Street, Chair of the Nebraska Sierra Club. Uh, I appreciate all the time you put into it. Uh, we obviously praise the large solar array and the fact that it's the capable for battery. I would like to just propose, uh, it looks like this is going to pass, so I'd like to propose some possibilities for what you do with the request for a proposal. So instead of just saying all the solar have to be ready, battery ready, why not let the companies bid for battery and then you can decide if they want to build a, a large one and they can say well, we can give you batteries and you're going to need four, four to eight hours sometimes, not 24. Why not let them bid for that and then let let us find out how much it is instead of just telling us batteries are too expensive. Let them bid on it. If you put an RFP out for gas, you're going to get gas. It's as simple as that. If you put an RFP out for what you really want, and that is resilience, reliability, affordability, environmentally sensitive, you might get something quite different. I would suggest that how you write that RFP is going to be very, very important. I would also say that, you know, community solar projects that you aren't the owner of, but you can allow to happen, can help you with this as well as demand side management. The Rocky Mountain, ever since this came out, I've been listening to podcasts, reading reports, doing all kinds of other things to see what other utilities are doing. The thing that most struck was a, a report that came out September 9th of this year from the Rocky Mountain Institute. And here's the title, which is a little arresting about what you're saying here. A bridge backward? The Risky Economics of New Natural Gas Infrastructure in the United States. Okay, so obviously you know something they don't. This is where the public comes in and we say, okay, how come what they say is wrong and what you say is right? 
I will give you this report, but those are the kinds of stakeholder input that we could get answers to prior to that. The final thing I would say is in mm -hmm. reference to some of the discussion going on right now, I, I, I don't know whether it holds you or not, but you have the words up to on a couple of things. So if somebody bids on 250 natural gas and you've got some other for 350 or whatever those numbers are, you don't have to bid both of those if you've got something that you find out in the interim uh, might be better. So I would just suggest that I don't suggest that you're not going to be uh, mindful in writing the RFP. I'm just suggesting that you can do it in a way that opens it up for that you just said earlier, the law says treating you as a company. A company wants to put out bids and get the best possible solution that they can, not the best thing that you can ask them for. They will only respond to what you ask for if you ask for what you really want. And that's all those things that I just read, resiliency, affordability, environmentally sensitive. You might get something quite different. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ken Hansen, um, I'm speaking um, uh, through the address of 4230 Leavenworth uh, for, uh, uh, as a senior leader for uh, UNMC in Nebraska Medicine. Um, I've had the uh, experience of working for uh, the campus for 14 years. Over those 14 years, and I have a, a little bit of a background in, in grid utility, uh, 30 years <laughs> prior to that. Uh, what we saw at the Med Center uh, 15 years ago, uh, the resiliency, the reliability, the, the pressure on the system uh, was second to none. Uh, what we started seeing a decade ago, uh, even, even uh, you know, seven, eight years ago, uh, the grid resiliency, when I'm talking resiliency, is, is voltage fluctuations. Uh, uh, being in, in, in uh, a peak demand uh, uh, situation where we're running generators, uh, where, where we have the, the load on, uh, uh, the, the, you know, I'll use for an example, we're doing 1,500 kW worth of solar panels on, on our roof. When we, had a, when, when we had a cloud go through this summer, uh, it almost, and it took the solar offline, it almost took down our system. So. Resiliency is key, and we are starting to see in the last five years, and I've had lots of discussion, uh, and believe you me, OPPD is in my office probably at least twice or three times a week. We have the discussions on the resiliency and the reliability of the system, and we've been talking about this stuff, we've been studying this stuff for a long time. I'm telling you from, from, a, from one of your biggest customers who needs the resiliency and reliability, Today is the day to take action and, and vote uh, this and, and, and move forward. We don't have any time left. We have to do something. So um, that's strong, um, 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 no stronger than I, I give you every day. Uh, uh, but but uh, 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 we, take care, we take care of uh, uh, 600 uh, critical care patients on campus uh, and uh, I'll tell you what, so, so in, in the healthcare industry, we talk about full volumes in the hospital. That means when the hospital's full. I've, I've been uh, tracking the hospital for five years. We've been in, in red seconds. condition. That means we've been 100% full in that hospital for five years without a break. We need the resiliency and the reliability, and we need it today. And we have gone through uh, the demand uh, reduction. We've gone through efficiencies. We've worked partner hand in hand with OPPD. Now, if we need, uh, if, if you need us as a partner to work through this, uh, we're here to, to work through that too. But today is the day to take action. Please. Thank you very much, Mr. Hansen. Um, hi, my name is Felicia Hilton. I am the um, government affairs person for North Central States Regional Council of Carpenters. Um, our address is uh, 10761 Virginia, Virginia Plaza. We have submitted comments to most of the board members, I do believe, but we came today to make sure that it was in the record publicly on our position on, on the project. Um, 
So North Central States Regional Council of Carpenters, we represent over 28,000 skilled carpenters, millwrights, pile drivers working throughout the states of Nebraska, Minnesota, Wisconsin, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Iowa. Millwrights and Local Union 1463 and the carpenters of Local 427 are chartered to operate in Omaha um, and throughout the state of Nebraska. Um, the siting of solar projects can support sustainable development and efficient use of resources and local jobs are connected to both. The jobs and the career opportunities created by these projects can help sustain communities or not. If the jobs are taken by out-of-state workers who take their paychecks and their skills back with them. Many players in the solar industry take a traveling workforce to perform the work. Solar is a valuable local resource, but it's not being used efficiently if a lot of the jobs and the income it generates go to people in other states or from out-of-state. Union carpenters and the millwrights are specifically trained to install all forms of renewable energy, including solar and the erection of wind towers. <clears throat> the thousands of experts in renewable energy construction are also teaching the next generation of skilled carpenters and millwrights via the participation in the Carpenters Apprenticeship Program and the Millwrights Apprenticeship Program here in um, Nebraska. Any developer of solar energy <coughs> in the OPPD area should commit to, one, having a plan to hire local skilled workers and to train the next generation of skilled workers through an apprenticeship program registered with the Department of Labor. Um, the developer should submit a written plan to hire locally and train locally. Um, and the North Central States Regional Council of Carpenters and our partnered contractors are committed to do that and we're willing to work with the board and um, the senior management to also help do that. Um, we are experts in this, and we would love to participate in this new initiative that you guys are taking on. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Luis Jimenez, 2205 uh, North 24th Street. Um, with all due respect, Mr. Burke, and to your thousands of hours, obviously we don't know how to do energy because the climate or the, the globe is suffering. Um, their animals are dying or are going extinct because of our energy use. Um, I uh, appreciate that once this is decided on, the public is going to be separated from the decision making process. Um, so it's, a, I mean, a, a delay is, is shouldn't, you shouldn't be taking insult for a delay, especially when the public is going to be separated from the process. Uh, I, and, and when the process starts, I, I'm okay with the procurement um, being, uh, you know, a, a negotiating uh, situation uh, since you're supposed to operate as a business. Uh, I would just encourage that you guys go on the higher end uh, with this, the 600 uh, wattages, megawattages, uh, because the, the world's watching. The, uh, well, the country's watching for sure what Omaha is going to do. And this would be a great example of uh, what this body is doing for uh, the future. Um, also, the gas, uh, I have no problem with the gas because it's, there's, it, it, it produces a reduction in carbon emissions. Um, so that, that's a good thing. Uh, this is a great idea, um, but we got to be co uh, cognizant of the process. Um, and one last thing, though, that, that doesn't pertain to this. I, I was asked for my ID to come here to a public body. I, that's concerning to me. If I had not brought my, um, uh, my ID, I would have to. They ask I, I don't know if I would have been allowed to enter this public body. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk to the Secretary of State about that, but they said this was a controlled area, even though it's, it's a public body. So um, that's concerning to me. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon again. My name is Ken Winston, Nebraska Interfaith Power and Light. Once again, appearing on behalf of, of our um, members and supporters who live in the, the LPPD service territory. Well, first of all, uh, the 
plans to invest in, in more than in up to 600 megawatts of, of solar generation, which is more than 50 times bigger than the entire solar capacity at the present time in the state. That's, well, I keep saying it's a big deal. I, I kind of have a broken record today, but it is a big deal. And so you're to be commended for that. So I want to, I want to keep, keep emphasizing that and, and, and want to celebrate that. Um, and then second, the retirement of the, of the coal units in North Omaha Station um, that have been planned for more than five years. Um, I was involved with uh, that activity uh, several years ago. And so it, it's, uh, I'm glad to see that it's being, that the steps are being taken to make it happen. And once again, I'm gonna use my cliche, it's a big deal to reduce the emissions by three million tons a year. That is significant and to reduce the emissions of a single facility by 90%. That's very significant. Um, also appreciate, and, and I appreciated the comments of the Carpenters Union. I hope that, that there are efforts made to hire local union employees. That, that should be part of any, any kind of contract. Um, we appreciate the fact that you're not anticipating a, a rate increase. That, that is also important um, because that protects the interests of your customer owners. We also um, note that, that you're planning to provide employment for all the people at North Omaha, and that's also important because jobs, people's jobs and, and helping people transition in this economy is also significant. However, having said all that, I'm going to, uh, to agree with Director Yoder's recommendation. Um, and I'm, I'm not discounting all of the work that everyone has put into this, and, and because I'm sure there's a lot of work that, that I don't know about as a, as a layperson on the outside. But uh, I also know how, how much work that Director Yoder and how much time he spent looking at these issues, and if he makes a suggestion like that, I know it's not made lightly. Uh, once investments are made in, in certain technologies, it's difficult to stop using those resources as better technologies emerge. And finally, I guess I'd also want to harken back once again to 2014. At that time, there was a commitment to, uh, thank you, to uh, reduce uh, demand by 300 megawatts. And it appears at this time that OPBD is not meeting those, those uh, benchmarks. We'd like you to revisit that and to, uh, to take more steps toward demand side reduction in your, in your planning. We'd be glad to respond to any questions. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, Alan Vavoka, 3719 Hamilton Street. Uh, the same guy you see at the Tuesday committee meetings. <laughs> You're familiar with me. Yeah, we recognize you. Huh? <clears throat> yeah. So um, there are a number of issues here. I have spent decades, fortunately retired now, as a capacity planner in the computer industry. And that was easier for me than the capacity that you guys are planning because I never had to recommend a resource with a 20-year life. So when people say this is a big deal, this is a big deal. This decision could go either way. You're committing to solving future problems with current technology, and you don't have any choice about that. That's what your situation is. Given that fact, I don't think it's a particularly bad idea to, as Mr. Yoder suggested, and believe it or not, I didn't even talk to him about this, but came up to, to the same conclusion on my own, that you don't need 600 megawatts by next year. You may not need it by the year after. You certainly need something right now. You've got to do part of it right now. There's no doubt about that. The possibility that some technology will emerge in the next three years that will satisfy this demand is kind of unlikely. But there is a likely possibility that the SPP regulations will change in the next three years. And those can change a lot faster than things like laws where you have to get legislators to agree to vote on something. The other part of my comment relates to the public outreach here. There were frequently asked questions and they were referred to a number of times. They had answers out on the website for at least a month, I'm guessing. Some of those answers were don't know. Don't know is 
an honest answer, and you should be commended for telling the truth. You don't know things like how much will the new gas assets be operated. But don't know wasn't the best answer that could have been made to that. We got a much better answer here today. Don't know is, well, it could be zero, it could be 100. 50 is right in the middle, but that's not the right answer. A lot of people like the 80-20 rule. It isn't 80, it isn't even 20. <coughs> Making that clear on the website in advance would have probably saved a lot of heartburn from people who wanted that answer and had no easy way to drill in and find out how much carbon you're going to be pumping out. I think there is another question that was notably absent Time. about how much this is going to cost. And I think a similar approach to an answer could have been possible on the website. I don't see anybody sitting in those board positions who would vote in favor of this measure, which I expect they'll do, if they had no idea if it's going to be $2 million or $20 million or $200 million. You guys have an idea of what this is going to cost that hasn't been communicated to the public. Time, and sir. as we move forward, thank you. I hope we can do a better job of communicating that. Francis Mendenhall, 3715 Hamilton, married to him. And I uh, won't repeat anything he said, but I agree with all of it. Uh, I, I uh, submitted questions online a week ago yesterday. Uh, your, your website says you respond in three business days. I didn't get a response. Uh, I asked a few people in this room for their, uh, their experience in that area and really I don't I don't think you responded to the public and this is um, I, and I don't say this in a mean spirit it's clear you did a lot of work and you did it quickly but you didn't include us and that's why I'm here to say I think delaying this vote by a little bit just long enough to get public input and really hear what your stakeholders feel and believe and can offer you. We might have a better idea than you, it's possible. Um, I think it's in order. So I, I thank <coughs> Director Yoder for his uh, speaking out and, uh, and Director Williams as well, that the public really hasn't been heard here. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Hey, Liz VZ, 912 North 49th Street, Omaha. Um, so I'm a Sierra Club member and Clean Energy Omaha member involved with a number of other groups. And first off, I really applaud the board for the updated SD7 that includes striving to go beyond environmental regulations and a net zero carbon goal. Though I'd definitely like to see it you know, achieved sooner than 2050. But the proposed 400 to 600 megawatts of solar is a great plan. I think it has overwhelming community support and really aligns with SD7 updates. And I know the board has worked really hard and I really appreciate the engagement around this power with purpose proposal. But I'm also very concerned about the gas proposal. We could be spending around half a billion dollars of public money on new gas infrastructure, which would have a best case scenario of being used little to none to reduce our emissions in line with SD7. That seems like a bad deal. One month for public engagement is not enough, especially when the decision seems to already have been made and the only public, the only real public engagement has been done by board members on their own with no standalone public meetings hosted by the district about this plan. I appreciated Director Williams' comment highlighting the problematic lack of public engagement um, and Yoder's uh, proposal to extend the decision. The district has known for at least a year about the need for additional generation, and this process seems rushed on purpose to reduce public input. Let's set up short-term capacity contracts if we need capacity soon, but vote no on new gas and create broader public conversation about how to best meet these needs in the public interest and avoid stranded assets. What else could we do with half a billion dollars that addresses our capacity needs by lowering peak as well as lowering bills, improving the lives of customer owners, and offering them the opportunity to be part of getting to net zero carbon, which is in line with SD7? Sadly, this process has not created an opportunity for this conversation. 
But here's some ideas. What if OPBD invested in rural microgrids with incentives for customer-owned distribu distributed generation and storage to increase reliability, decrease peak, and reduce emissions? What if OPBD offered a tariffed on-bill financing program for energy efficiency that provided a way to finance cost-effective upgrades with no upfront costs and no loans? What if OPBD provided small stipends or bill credits to customer owners to enlist their neighbors, businesses, nonprofits, and more in signing up for these energy efficiency and demand management programs and more to decrease our peak <coughs> demand and increase resiliency of our grid? What if we invested in smart meters and a smart grid that could better manage load to align with renewable energy generation? What else could we do to engage customers in creating the solutions as they lower bills and increase their comfort and satisfaction? An OPBD that is working with and invested in lo investing in local organizations and customer owners to meet these needs is my vision of a real energy partner uh, for public power that serves the public interest. So I support Yoder's proposal to vote no to gas, delay that, and vote yes to solar. Let's be creative and figure out how to address these challenges together without fossil fuels. Yeah. John Pollock, 1412 North 35th Street, Omaha. You've just heard some great ideas as far as I'm concerned. I think uh, we've got some significant reasons to, uh, to delay the full implementation uh, and at most do this in phases instead of all at once. Uh, I do think that... Uh, the, you've had demand side and efficiency on the table for a number of years. If there had been more progress in that direction, we might be talking about less natural gas capacity right now. Uh, I've already submitted comments, so I think this is sufficient. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Scott Williams, 1139 93rd Avenue. Um, I'm thrilled to see a proposal that brings uh, clean, renewable, local power onto the OPBD grid. Um, it was only just earlier this year that we were in this room hearing about the first large scale solar project that was five megawatts. <laughs> um, today we're hearing a proposal for 500 megawatts of solar. Um, interpolating from those two points, I cannot wait to see what the next solar proposal holds. <laughs> um, seriously, please do bring more solo, solar online as fast as you can. Um, I'm sorry to hear that it is coupled with uh, the expense of fossil investments, um, infrastructure that is not going to be versatile or repurposed into the future. Um, and I hope that it does not end up becoming a stranded asset as the acceleration which I just described, with clean and renewable energies and storage technologies continues to accelerate. Uh, I would be sorry to see um, fossil assets becoming uh, prohibitively expensive to operate um, because the sunk cost will be unrecoverable and we will still have to provide uh, energy in uh, uh, fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory ways to the customer owners of the district. Um, so I hope that this isn't what happens to this, these assets. Um, I hope that they do um, provide the resiliency that they, are, um, that they are slated to provide, which certainly they will. And I hope that um, it is in a cost competitive fashion and also environmentally sensitive as well. Um, so thank you for bringing solar online to our grid. Thank you for um, keeping the lights on for all of us uh, every day when we flip the switch. Um, even when there are straight line wind events, that was a new term that I learned through this process. Uh, it means tornado. Uh, Not necessarily microburst. Not necessarily microburst. John. Yeah. John. Ask John Noble. Uh, I'm going to defer yeah. to John. Uh, that was just a new phrase. I'm not even sure I did learn it during this process, apparently. Let's talk offline. Um, but yeah, thank you for keeping the lights on for all of us every time we flip the switch. And thank you for your commitment to continuing to provide clean, renewable energy through public power. And in that goal uh, that you just recently set of SD7 working towards uh, a net zero carbon public power district. Thank you. Hi again, my name is Laverne. So um, yeah, we have been working on this for 35 years. I ran for office in 92. You can look at my Earth Day video of me burning hydrogen with solar and wind. So some of us have been working on this. Now the natural gas solution, Yoder, I really want you to just be calm. 
This is the transitional period you're guiding us through that will be converted to hydrogen. You can't convert a coal plant to hydrogen, but you can convert a natural gas to hydrogen. And the fact that you've included that it, ne it, it needs to be a generator that can be converted later to something else in your proposal helps me know that at some day when shipping finally embraces hydrogen electric as they're shipping, it'll come down in cost and you'll be able to convert that. Now what I'm really here for is that something I notice you're not doing <clears throat> is something like this community did, a regional renewable energy procurement project. Uh, utilize collaborative procurement to purchase renewable energy systems from public agencies. Uh, they were able to include 19 participating agencies across four counties, including cities, counties, special districts, and schools, 180 renewable energy installations with 30 megawatts total, okay? <clears throat> Solar power, sta uh, police stations is my favorite. Uh, and also parking garages. Now, the reason this is important is because one solar panel strategically placed benefits me in multiple ways. It satisfies your green initiatives. It satisfies my utility cost of it going down. It also satisfies my taxes that pay for the police department and these public facilities in the city. And, and all of those agencies have money set aside to decarbonize or to green or, or whatever their efforts are, so you can tap into those resources, working collaboratively with these organizations. <clears throat> now, I've given all of the county board members, city council mayor, and the chief of police a, a, a nice packet with Tim's number on it to call him. They kept asking if my number, and I'm like, well, call Tim, don't call me. I don't know. You know? And I put it right on there. I don't know if any of them did, but probably not. But I did do that to kind of saturate the government with the idea that you guys need to collaborate with these other agencies so I can reduce my whole carbon footprint that I'm paying into via taxes to the government and via you, the utility. Anyway, and plus, um, with the police departments, my most favorite is because um, when uh, we surround it like they did in the early 1900s, and the grid goes down, and their generator breaks because mechanical stuff breaks, they're going to have that extra layer of solar panels that are going to provide that extra layer of homeland security, a federal uh, uh, initiative. So one strategically placed solar panel is really, really important. And you clumping them together seconds. is not taking advantage of the distributive nature. So one cloud caused uh, the hospital problems. But that cloud wasn't over the entire city, it was just over the hospital. So if you distribute it around the utilities, then clouds here, winds here, that's all over, and you can get advantages of a you know <clears throat> blue sky, cloudy day as the different panels are jumping on and off. I totally understand this proposal. I totally understand why you're doing it. I totally understand the future and the vision. Please vote for it today. I have been seriously coming in here since the late 80s, early 90s, proposing this exact thing. And um, so just do it, OK? 35 freaking years, 40 years. How long do we got to wait? Because once you start down this path of renewable, you did five. Now you're up to 500. You'll be up to 5,000. Because once you start down this path, it's a slippery slope. Efficiency is, is a beautiful thing. Renewables are beautiful, and you can't help yourself. You just will slip down that slope, and the next thing will be 100% renewable. So vote for it. Thank you very much, and have a nice day. Thank you very much. Papers. 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 Thank you. Just do it. Thank you. Hi guys. My name is Crystal Craig, and I live at 3521 Haskell Street. And um, I, I'd like to say that um, I'm, in, I'm, I'm happy to see the engagement with the the board and some discussions happening and, and I'm happy to see things not just being rubber stamped through. There's been a lot of great changes it looks like since I've been here. And um, I've got my children, they're bigger now. And I wanna talk about what I always like to talk about and that's, you know, um, I wanna talk about sustainability and I wanna talk about the future because when I used to talk about my children and my children's children, I have two grandchildren now. So that day is here, like now. Um, so whatever it is that you guys do, you know, I just want to emphasize, like, please just keep the long term in mind with what you're doing here. Um, and I, I, I really am pretty impressed with what's like all of the things that are happening here. And um, more public engagement would be great, as always. Um, but uh I think that, I think you guys, I think you're gonna do okay. I think whatever is happening, like I'm, I'm feel really pretty good about 
what's going on right now and, and the thought that is and the work that's obviously being put into to these things is is great. And I appreciate things being brought up and discussed. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing what's going to happen. Thanks. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mark Welsh. I live at 5611 Howard Street in Omaha, Nebraska. And thank you for everything you've done. I haven't been here as long as Laverne or Francis Mindenhall. Uh, I've, only, that. I've only been here about 10 years uh, watching uh, all of you and previous board members do the right thing. Uh, you've really made a lot of changes since I came on board here. Uh, under uh, being pushed by Ann McGuire, you've, you've gone from uh, almost no wind, I think, in 10 years ago to having a goal of 10%. Now you're at 30-ish percent. Uh, going higher yet. Uh, as was mentioned, you've gone from no solar to five megawatt solar. Now you're putting in 500 megawatt solar. Now, if you follow that, it's not 5,000. Laverne's got good math skills, but that next jump is 50,000 at that rate. So uh, I look forward to 50,000 watts, not just solar, but alternative energy. Now, how do you get to 50,000 watts of alternative energy? The, the answer is real simple. You support a law in Congress that would put a price on carbon, and you give all that money back to the people in your district and throughout the United States. Because if you put a price on carbon, entrepreneurs in this country and around the world are going to come to the United States. And they're going to develop new, cheaper, alternative energy that will be a boon to mankind. And that's what's needed, is I, I hope that in the very, very near future that you will be discussing a carbon fee and dividend resolution that will help us take that next step forward to new alternatives that we don't even know of. You know, I, I've heard of hydrogen. I've heard of, of great big wind-up batteries, or not batteries, uh, wind-up uh, springs that some companies are using in Omaha, or at least one company, is winding up a spring and, and using that energy to, when they need to use it. Uh, who'd have thought? that you could build a spring that big to generate electricity for a business in Omaha. There's got to be something else out there that we haven't even thought of yet. That bill that's the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act that I've been working to get seconds. passed for almost 10 years, uh, that's the right thing to work on. We need OPPD support to get that to move in Congress. Uh, I know it hasn't moved yet. We need your support to make it move. It's in the best interest of OPPD and your customer owners. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, my name is Holly Wiedemeyer, and I wasn't planning on talking today, as you can see by my scribbles here, but, but I am moved uh, by the directors and the board and by everyone's passion here. Um, and I just wanted to make a few observations. First, Veterans Day was Monday. Thank you everyone here who served. I know many of you did and still are. Thank you for your public service. Thank you for coming and speaking up. Uh, I normally don't have the opportunity to come. It happened to today. Um, I'm a member of the Nebraska Sierra Club. I'm a member of, of the uh, Conservation Voters, League of Conservation Voters as well. Um, so clearly you know where my concerns are. Um, I commend you, that's why I'm here. I commend you, I'm very excited about the, the goal that's now going to be in place. Uh, carbon emissions and, and that is definitely the way to go. That's very clear. Couple things that did concern me that I heard. Uh, Director Yoder, thank you for bringing up the concept of time. Did we not, did we allow enough time? So I heard that. I heard at the same time the concerns about we got to get going. We got to get going, and I agree with both sides of that. What I wanted to say though, 
I wanted to ask you to make sure any decisions that are made, language that is put in place, does not keep us from changing direction later. So just as we were just hearing about new technology, you know what? I bought a hybrid in, I don't know, about 2000. A year later, I mean, it was like top of the line. I was so excited to be reducing my carbon. Uh, guess what? Next year, a Prius came out, much more affordable, better technology. If I just waited a little bit, and obviously I didn't wait, and I'm glad I didn't wait because I wanted to do something, but that's the type of uh, resilience and ability to change gears that this seconds. body has to have. Um, I also heard some comments from, it might have been Director McGuire, it might have been Mulhoff. Um, both of you said some things that got me thinking. Um, in the beginning, you said, we're going to need you all to help us out. And I agree 100%. One thing that did seem to be missing, we're making some assumptions. Our experts in energy are making some assumptions that we don't have other ideas that can't be brought forward. So don't limit us because I don't hear a lot right now, and I don't want us to be prevented from, in the future, having more public involvement. So what can I do as a consumer? Uh, what can I do, what can you do to help me uh, take advantage of solar on my own or to, to in other ways, to decrease my demand? Um, so please consider that, and don't lock us into a situation where we are, um, dependent on gas and can't be agile in our future decisions and needs as things change. Thank you. Thank you. Motion to call the question. Yeah. Second. We have a motion to call the question. It's public input done. Uh, do any this kid is Do any directors want to say any and more comments? I think we've got Yeah, I do. Director Moody, I think you want to say something. Um, just <laughs> so I think there are a couple important things that were brought up and I just want to quickly respond to them. Um, a couple questions about the RFP process and how flexible it might be to allow for creative proposals. That was something we discussed in pretty good length in closed session and I think we're striking a nice balance there by allowing by giving good direction but allowing for some creative proposals to come back. Uh, that's one. Um, there was some reference to a limitation in the kinds of alternatives we looked at uh, as part of this program. Mr. Underwood, we started with 70 million. Correct. So I think it's fair to say we, we pulled a lot of things together. I won't go through them all. More than anything... Um, we got plenty of time. <laughs> uh, there have been a couple comments about the public outreach, and I want to I respond to that really quickly. Um, I think, you know, in the same way that the last speaker said two things are true, I think two things are true here. One is, yes, we can do better. Absolutely, we can always do better. <coughs> but it's also true that we do public outreach every single day. Um, when I joined this board, we, we have completely ramped up in the three years that I've done this. Um, every single strategic directive that we look at is informed by public input. Um, so I, I think it's, while we can do a better job in this particular instance in terms of going out and getting public feedback and getting input, um, I think it's, it's also inaccurate to say that's the only time that it happens. It happens on a really regular basis. Um, so I, I just wanted to respond to a couple of those comments that were out there. Yeah, thank you very much for mm -hmm. that comment. And we want to thank uh, Lisa Olson and her whole group as far as communications. The amount of uh, responses that they have gotten, uh, first of all, the amount of responses that they put out and try and making contact with both in the, within the community and everything, uh, not, you know, asking one-on-ones, actually bringing groups in and discussing with groups what was going on. That has happened. That didn't happen five, ten years ago. None of it happened. When Lisa also came, she's the one who started all this as far as the stakeholder process. She's the one who started the thing in 2016 when we had the great big thing. This is continuing to improve. And it, I think social media has made more of a demand on the entire, you know, with board directors and, you know, with the community responding. They, they, we get so many back, they want an immediate response. Well, 
we tried to sort of pare that down as far as our personnel, the amount of time that that group has spent, you know, 24-7 answering questions has been astronomical. And I want to point that group out as far as, you know, it looks like they got hit a little bit hard on the uh, stakeholder, uh, but I think they actually did a very, very good job. We always could improve. I think where we could improve again is maybe, you know, a little bit more advanced notices, and that will be looked at in PI. Uh, any other questions before we put this to a vote? Okay, may we have a vote, please? Bogner? Yes. Kavanaugh? Yes. Gay? Yes. McGuire? Yes. Molhoff? Yes. Moody? Yes. Williams? Yes. Yoder? No. Motion carried. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, now I, we, I think we should applaud and thank all of management and all of the customers. We've done a good job. Everyone has done a good job. And I thank the public, I thank the directors, and I thank all of OPPD and the amount of thousands and thousands of hours that management and the hundreds of hours that uh, the board has put into this. Uh, now we have President's Report. President's Report. So Dr. Mendenhall, we'll get you your answer. Did she leave already? Yeah. So she left. So we'll get answers to her question. Uh, uh, we, we did have a hard cut because the same people doing those were doing corporate operating plan and a variety of other things, but we'll make sure we'll get her, her answers. If you go to the, the first slide here, our uh, October base load generation, you see Nebraska City 1, 2, and 3. Uh, Nebraska City uh, 1 had no forced outages. Um, really cooler weather, market conditions. Uh, Nebraska City 2 had 11 day outage due to a main steam break. Units 4 and 5 at North Omaha. Uh, had uh, two really uh, market-related shutdowns uh, because of uh, uh, low demand in the in the market uh, today, anyway, um, or this past month. And uh, unit number five uh, was actually uh, down for about 50 hours. If you go to the uh, peaking generation, um, this is one of the lower months that we've seen on the peaking generation. You did see unit number three that came on in the month of October, primarily due to. Um, um, uh, system conditions and resiliency conditions that we've been talking about. This is one of those that came on and was asked to run for a period of time uh, to be able to do that. We haven't really seen that kind of um, capacity factor for a long time. Matter of fact, all the other peaking facilities, um, actually this is uh, lower than they were last year at the same time. So just a, just a point in time. And here's a uh, kind of an ongoing, if you take a look at where we are over the period of years, this goes to uh, 1992 to 2019, um, you know, we're, we're probably normal relative to uh, if you take out the flood, if you take out some of the other uh, kind of market emergencies that we've seen, we're probably similar to last year, maybe a little bit more than that, but you kind of see the, uh, the amount of generation coming from our peaking facilities. On the community solar side, uh, some of you that participate in that may have gotten an email, um, like I did. Um, our crews are back. Uh, they're working uh, as of November 4th. They began to work back in some of that flooded area. Uh, the, the, the high water area in that will, will not be an issue once the system is installed, uh, but it was just tough to move equipment and, and people in and out of there. So we're looking for a commercial operation date uh, in late December. Uh, honoring our community, uh, we had 75 middle and high school young men and women at the Elkhorn Center on October 15th. The students attended were from a variety of different high schools and middle schools in the area. Uh, we had OPPD, MUD, Black Hills Energy, Metro Community College really give some hands-on experience to these young men and women about potential uh, STEM uh, application and uh, potential opportunities. Uh, also in Connect the Dots, um, we uh, spent some time down in the Syracuse area uh, where, um, excuse me, is this the Connect, yeah, this is Connect the Dots, uh, or is this? No, this yeah, is the, no, it's not. This is a Serve Nebraska step forward. We'll do Connect the Dots in a little bit here. So this is, uh, OPPD was honored as um, the uh, top large business uh, corporate uh, volunteer across the state of Nebraska, which is a great honor. Uh, and it's because of the work that we've been doing with Habitat for Humanity, food drives, literacy engagement, energy assistance, fundraisers, filling sandbags for others during the floods this past March, and just all the other volunteer work uh, that we do, including some of the work that we did just this uh, past October um, 
at the uh, in South Omaha at the OPPD and Habitat for Humanity Rock the Block. We had over 70 employees and some of their family members that attended. That essentially over a two or three block area um, essentially um, just beautified that area from building uh, new porches uh, to building new awnings to painting to shrubbery. Um, and I got to haul uh, rock and sand. Um, I think they didn't think I had the capability to do any of the technical things, so uh, just a hard back. Uh, but it was just a great opportunity. We had our forestry group go in the, the week or so before just to do a bunch of tree trimming and, pre and prepare the site. And then two of the individuals that are in this picture here, um, one of them is uh, Miguel uh, Rojas Hammond, who is on our legacy group, and, and Barbara Barrientos. Um, uh, Miguel is is completing his degree in the line school at Metro, um, and he and Barbara, Barbara is going through um, University of Nebraska at Omaha, uh, majoring in project management, and and so both of them were project managers for this site. It's a great opportunity to use those skill sets and to really experience those. It's just a great opportunity for us to to be there and and have a great time. Um, and somewhere in there is the did I miss one? What Did I miss connect the, the dots? dots? What is connect the dots? It's yeah. there, but what is it? You don't have it in your. Oh, uh, anyway, connect the dots. So what we did down in Syracuse, there's uh, over 300 students, if I'm not mistaken, that participate in connect the dots. This is an opportunity for them to get real hands-on experiences around STEM, STEM-related um, education services and activities. Um, and so we did this in multiple southeast Nebraska counties, like we did on the on the northwest side of our service territory uh, earlier earlier this uh, year. And so this is just a great opportunity for us to uh, continue uh, to engage uh, with young men and women and talk about STEM, whether it's computer engineering or mechanical engineering or line technicians or steam fitter mechanics or whatever that may be. So just a great opportunity for us to engage um, within those communities and it's in partnership uh, with uh, the Nebraska, um, there we go, phone a friend, the extension, extension office. office, thank you very much. And then last, I think, uh, oh, the Wind and Solar Conference. Uh, we had a variety of people, including some in this room as visitors as well, but a lot of OPPD employees that participated and talked about the Power with Purpose uh, recommendation that uh, we were making to the board. But we had a lot of demonstrations. Several of our folks participated in panels just to talk about what we're doing around electric vehicles, around community solar, and a number of different uh, activities. And then uh, finally, we end each one of our meetings, our board meetings, uh, with really a thought of someone who died in the line of duty. Uh, this is just a, an opportunity for us to reflect on uh, the men and women that are out um, uh, day in and day out, weekend and week out, during the holidays when we're home celebrating. Uh, they're out either in power plants or in trucks or they're doing a variety of different work. And in this example, uh, Ed Runka uh, died on April 16th, 1946, while working on a 76 uh, 100 volt uh, line in Bellevue, Nebraska. He was attempting to fasten his safety belt uh, when he made contact with the line. He was 56 years old with 26 years at OPPD at the time of his death. Uh, he was survived by his mother, two brothers, and five sisters. And that concludes my president's report. Thank you very much. And one other thing that I want to add on as to what OPPD employees help with is uh, Heat the Street. Uh, Thirteen years ago, OPPD uh, started Heat the Street and um, the Heat the Street Run and Walk Run for Energy Assistance Program. And this year, again, MUD and OPPD are working together as far as energy assistance and to get, get money for energy assistance. For everybody put on their tennis shoes, it's going to be March 7th, Saturday. Uh, it's, and it's um, the registration opens, early registration, if you want to, want to save some money, December 2nd at heatthestreetsomaha.org. So I just wanted to mention that. And I will be mentioning it every month because I want to get some more money for uh, energy assistance for both MUD and OPPD. Now, we do have, if anyone wants to say anything extra in addition, and I go, good, John's here for the weather forecast. We need it. Thank you. It's been rough lately, John. I'll, I'll be brief. We've been here a long time. Uh, we've got uh, a period of nice weather coming up. We've got a uh, southern storm track that's mainly going south of us, a northern storm track that's going north of us, and keeping the, the worst of the cold air bottled up in Canada after our last blast. That lasts the next 10 to 12 days. 
uh, you will note that that doesn't quite get us out to Thanksgiving. Uh, at that point, the models start to equivocate about whether they, we stay in this uh, milder pattern for a while or whether the uh, northern storm track begins to move down and give us more problems with winter weather. Uh, simply don't know at this point. Uh, and then Director Mohoff gets a specialized forecast oh, afterwards, so it doesn't have to take up everybody's time. Oh, yeah, she's going, she's going someplace else. She's a Kiwi. She gets a Kiwi right. forecast. Thank you very much, and thank you, everyone, uh, for your participation and sticking around. We really appreciate it.